and customers who claimed that they were improperly switched companies. This hearing of the Government Information, Justice and Agriculture Subcommittee will come to order. Today we'll be looking at the practice of slamming, as it's become known in the industry. And we have a long day ahead of us, uh, e excellent panels. And let me just say in advance that I anticipate a lot of votes on the floor today. I think that's correct, isn't it, Ms. McCandless? Yes, uh, sure. yeah. you may anticipate a lot of votes on the floor. Mr. And, uh, uh, and so therefore we're going to move as expeditiously as we can. I would ask witnesses to summarize their statements. Uh, everyone's written statement has been submitted, will be made a part of the record in its entirety. So I would ask you to try and summarize your statement uh, to within five minutes if you can. And please, uh, I will also ask your indulgence as we go back and forth uh, to votes uh, today. Uh, could I have the agenda, please? If you've been watching television lately, you realize there's a fierce battle going on for your long distance telephone business. Commercials for the nation's major long distance telephone carriers are now a regular part of prime time viewing. The ads tout the price and sound quality of long distance calls as well as the level of service that the carriers provide. Competition is a good thing. It can keep prices down, it can lead to innovation, and it can do what we as a nation have chosen for our long distance marketplace. But there can be a downside to competition as well. And lately, long distance competition in some areas may have gotten out of hand. Allegations have been made that unsavory marketing practices designed to obtain new customers are prevalent in the industry. The term for these practices is slamming. Now, I remember in football, you step out on the football field, that's voluntary slamming. Two people out there and they consent to getting slammed and if they get bruised, the bruises come out of their voluntary action. That's not the case here because here slamming occurs when a customer of one long distance company is switched to another long distance company without that customer's authorization. Here's how it often works. You receive a call from a salesperson who describes the benefits of a long distance carrier other than your own and asks whether you want to switch to another carrier. You may say, perhaps, or gee, send me some information, or you may flatly say, no. But a month or two later, when you get your phone bill, you notice that your long distance calls have been billed to the company that sought your business instead of being billed to your usual carrier. Guess what? You've just been slammed. Bell Atlantic reports that in 1988, 18,000 of their customers complained that they had been slammed, with the figure jumping to more than 37,000 in 1989. Bell Atlantic now estimates that in their seven state area, this number will climb to more than 80,000 such unauthorized changes in 1990. And let me say, that doesn't take in the kind of changes that occur by clear. I'm concerned about what the Federal Communications Commission is doing, and that's why I'm glad that they are a witness here today, because we're going to be asking them that very question. This matter of slamming has been before them for a number of months, and I think that they've had adequate time to address the problem and to propose some solutions. So we look forward to hearing from the FCC today and to see, indeed, whether there are some solutions uh, that they're working on. The figures tell me and the statistics tell me that on a nationwide basis, if you just take that one Bell operating company, and now remembering that there are nine such companies across the country, these figures tell me that on a nationwide basis, slamming is a very big problem. This morning, we're here to learn more about the problem and explore ways to solve it. Along the way, we'll hear from slamming victims, state regulators, long distance carriers, a regional Bell operating company, and the Federal Communications Commission. Turn to Mr. McCandless for any opening statement he may wish to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do not have an opening statement. Uh, I think you've covered the area recently well, fairly well, very well, in fact. I would just uh, say to our panels, I'm involved on the floor sometime today, depending upon how the ball bounces. And so if I depart, it's not because of uh, that I wish to leave the, the scene. It's just that I have another assignment. Thank you. Thank you. For our first Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Schiff. Delighted to have you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very briefly, I want to congratulate you on holding this hearing. I think it's a very important subject and one that covers uh, many potential consumers. My own view uh, is general at the moment. I think that telemarketing, if used correctly, can be a, a tremendous service to the consumers. I think if not used correctly, can be a, a terrible harassment to consumers. And I'm very interested in listening to the testimony to find out what the situation is exactly here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schiff. 
Our first panel consists of three consumer witnesses who all say that they've been victims of slamming. In order to locate consumers, we contacted the Public Service Commissions in Maryland and my home state of West Virginia, as well as the Virginia State Corporation Commission. We also got in touch with Bell Atlantic and the American Association of Retired Persons. Our three consumer witnesses are Mr. Anthony Cerconi from Washington, D.C., Ms. Louise Simmons from Bridgeport, West Virginia, and Mr. William F. McDonald from Annandale, Virginia. To our panel, to this panel and to all panels who come thereafter, it is the practice of this subcommittee to swear in all witnesses so as not to prejudice any witnesses who may ever appear before it. Do any of you have any, uh, any objection to being sworn? If you would stand and raise your right hand. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Thank you very much for being here, and I know in, certainly in the case of Ms. Simmons uh, that you've driven a, a good ways to be here, and with the others, uh, other two gentlemen also. We'll put your testimony in the record as it is. I would invite you to summarize in any way you wish, and why don't we just go in the order that we're, you're listed on the agenda, uh, Mr. Anthony Sarconi from Washington, D.C. will be first. Thank you. Uh, I represent today myself and my wife, who were slamming victims. This word always makes me laugh in a way, but in some ways it's appropriate. Uh, the simple situation was that around February of last year in 89, I'm sorry, February of 1990 and uh, late last year, 1989, we were called twice by Sprint, U.S. Sprint representatives asking whether or not we wanted their services. Uh, we answered both times firmly, no, we were happy with our services with AT&T and we intended no changes. Uh, on March 25th, 1990, when our bill came from the regular C&P local bill, which of course has a long distance company billings within it, we found that our bill was approximately $1.46, which is extremely low since my wife lives in Switzerland and her family and we call her quite often. When we called C&P, we found out obviously that we were switched to U.S. Sprint and we received shortly thereafter the first bill from U.S. Sprint. This is put down in a letter that I sent to Mrs. Castle, or I'm sorry, Ms. Castle, of, of 15 October 1990, which is the lead letter, and also I'm just skimming through many of the dates that I have in that as well. A number of things happen in the course of trying to find out how this happened and what to do about rectifying it. Of course, we called CMP, we called AT&T, we called U.S. Sprint, we were changed. That was verified by everyone. And people from CMP at one point suggested that we simply send back the bill with a refusal of payment as well as a letter. That I did. And that's the letter of, of April 7, 1990, which is enclosed in the, the, the record that I sent. Uh, they continue to send us bills at the final tally was something around $36, which for us is not obviously that high. And so the, the, the cost was not the situation. Obviously, the principle was the problem. We also found out through talking to people at CMP later, as well as people in the FCC and AT&T, that this was a prevalent problem and um, that the way that often happens is that one could be switched electronically without the user knowing it. Obviously, this is, this is the basis of the problem. That was told to us on April 20th by a person named Gil Green from CNP. That day, I also spoke with Kerry King on April 20th in the morning. And he, this, or this person, Kerry King, told us that there should have been a document which was sent to the local CNP company, which contained our signatures, verifying that we wanted to switch from one long distance company to another. And that is what I asked in a letter to Ms. Ms. Kneff, Ms. Neff, who works at FCC, that if, if this document could be produced, I would like to see it, because we had never signed any such document. We had never had any intentions of changing at all. Uh, on, on April 20th, also, we sent our first letter to Kathy Kneff at the FCC after contacting her at the suggestion of someone at CMP. Uh, she was very helpful. She told us exactly what needed to be done, a letter to her stating what the problem was, the events that occurred. I've included that as well in the, the packet or the document that you have. From that time period on, we, continued, we started to receive somewhat 
varying threatening letters, basic letters saying from U.S. Sprint that the bill was in default and that certain privileges would be cut off. Number one, of course, the, the loss of the services from U.S. Sprint, which was not really a problem for us. Secondly, they began to say that collection agencies would be brought into the, to the picture. And finally, our last letter, which we received from them, which is dated the 31st of July, 1990, was a form letter of sorts coming from the a lawyer in the collection agency at U.S. Sprint, threatening at that time, obviously, legal ramifications. Now, we were in Switzerland for the month of July, so we did not receive this letter until August 8th, thereabouts, first week in August. This letter caused us great consternation. Uh, the bill was not very high. The ramifications seemed somewhat steep. And frankly, the other problem was that we, as full-time students, as well as working full-time on the side, did, did not have the money nor the time, really, to know about going how to fight this. So we paid the bill. I mean, that's the bottom line in terms of the bill. So the bill was paid, and they sent a letter saying that the account had been cleared. However, we, we were happy that the complaint went through and continued. The other problem with pay, the other reason why we paid the bill was frankly that we received no word until after we returned from Switzerland that the FCC was continuing in its uh, own investigation. We received letters in the months of later August, middle of August, as well as early September that investigations were going on at both CMP as well as uh, as well as U.S. Sprint. Inclusive in these letters were a standard form which FCC sends to these companies regarding how the investigation will go continue on. They sent us a copy of that uh, mailing to them as well in the letters. We received finally on, uh, I believe it was uh, September 17th, sorry, September 7th, 1990, the findings of the investigation of U.S. Sprint, which in my opinions are, in my opinion, is a very, was a very lame investigation if indeed what they have written is the fullness of their investigation, mainly because they've confused two accounts that we had had before. My wife had already had a phone card from U.S. Sprint account started in September of 1987 when she first moved to this city. They seem to have confused those two accounts with this very latest account, which was by their records begun February 10th, 1990. Uh, furthermore, they offer no reason as to why anything was switched. They just say, we're sorry uh, if no verification was made. That seems to be the major problem as far as I'm concerned, the matter of verification. There doesn't seem to be any verification between the local telephone company and, and the user or between the local telephone company and, a comp and these other long distance companies which say, well, we're now willing, we now want to switch a person. They have requested us to switch. Without that verification, obviously the problem arises that switchovers, slamming can occur without the, without the user's notice. So that's a tentative conclusion on my part. I don't want to skew anything. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sarconi. Our next witness uh, coming from the mountain state of West Virginia, we'd like to have her with us, is uh, Louise Simmons from Bridgeport. Ms. Simmons. Thank you, Mr. Wise. For the past several years, I and almost everyone else I know have been called frequently by telephone solicitors on the behalf of MCI. The caller usually begins with something like, after identifying who he or she is, and they begin with something like, uh, who is your long distance carrier? And I've always replied, it was AT&T. Well, we can save you money, is the next <coughs> line. And I always have tried to be polite to these callers and tell them that I am not interested in changing my long distance carrier, that I'm entirely satisfied with the service. And then, uh, the caller comes back with some, well, then you are not interested in saving money. And to me, the implication is that uh, I must not be very intelligent. I've always tried to be polite, and in spite of the fact that I consider the solicitor's tactics to be quite rude, I try to maintain my demeanor. I've patiently tried to explain that I value good service equally with economy. And I remind the caller that there is something to be said for loyalty to a company who has served one well. And I reiterate to them that I have no desire to change my service. And then, usually, it's another remark about, well, if you're not interested in saving money, and then hang up of the phone with not even the common courtesy of thanking me for my time. 
after what happened to me last spring, sometime before March 1990, I will find it quite hard to be polite to such solicitors in the future. Mm -hmm. My first indication that I had something, that something different was happening on my telephone service occurred when I attempted to call my daughter in Los Angeles, California, using her AT&T Call Me card. She told me to use it uh, when I called her so that she could pay the bill. Well, I had never before used it because I'm a person that likes to pay my own bills, but I decided on this one February or March evening that I would use it. She had told me that an operator would come on the line and ask for certain information, and this is what happened. A gentleman asked for the card number and other pertinent details that he needed to know. After a few moments, he said the call would not go through. What do you mean, I ask? And his answer, as well as I can recall it, was, well, sometimes they give us their access codes and sometimes they don't. What do you mean, I ask, when you say they won't give you their access code? Who is this they? AT&T, he replied. I asked how such a thing could be, and I explained that I was an AT&T customer calling another AT&T customer using an AT&T card. He told me that I was mistaken, that my long-distance carrier was MCI. I told him this was not so. He insisted that I was mistaken, that MCI was my carrier. I was irate. He said there was a number I could call to try to get through, but I told him just to forget about it, and I dialed my daughter direct at my own expense. My daughter and I chatted about the conversation that I had had with this operator. We, in our naivete, thought that some wires were crossed or something. And I thought no more about the incident until I received my March bill from my local <laughs> telephone company, CNP Telephone. Among the pages of billing uh, sheets were several sheets carrying the MCI logo, and I was astonished to learn that I was being billed by that company for long distance calls in the amount for that month, something over $9. I call CNP telephone immediately, and when I say immediately, I mean within five minutes after I opened the bill. I was told by the person who took my call that there must be some mistake. Her record, she said, showed me to be a customer of AT&T. She did give me an 800 number I could call to verify who my carrier was. I called the number, wondering as I dialed why I should have to be doing this when I knew full well who my long distance carrier was supposed to be. But I learned, however, that indeed my long distance carrier was now MCI. I was a customer of MCI whether I wanted to be or not. I called CNP back only to hear a recorded message telling me that the business day was over and I would have to recall, uh, call them on Monday. This was a Friday. By chance, I saw an AT&T advertisement on television the next day, and gave, it gave a number to call if you had once been a customer of AT&T and wanted to return at no cost. We've all seen those. I called that number and told the gentleman who answered about my situation. He told me they could send me a card to sign. It would take a little time, though, he said, because AT&T had to have my signature in order to switch me back. I told him MCI had neither a signature nor a verbal agreement to switch me to their company. This was not supposed to be done, he said. He added that AT&T had received many such complaints. At my request, he supplied me with a telephone number for MCI. I called and talked to a woman from their Baltimore office. I don't recall her name. She said she could not find my name on her computer, but she promised to call CNP and straighten the matter out. She even called me back in a few days to say she had done so. However, the bills kept coming. Each time a bill came, I paid only the amount I owed CNP for calls within the state of West Virginia and subtracted the amount they said I owed MCI. I wrote notes on the bills that I returned at first. I got no replies, only continuing bills. Finally, I wrote a long letter to CNP explaining my side of the issue. I re received no reply to that letter either, unless you count a notice that my service was about to be disconnected as a reply. At this point, I called the Public Service Commission of West Virginia. 
a Ms. Blair from that office handled the matter, and my telephone <laughs> service was not disrupted. I feel like the Public Service Commission of West Virginia did a good job for me, and I want to publicly thank them. To shorten what could develop into a long saga here, he's asked us to summarize. I will summarize the rest. I have submitted, as part of my testimony, copies of three letters that I sent to CNP Telephone, two to the Public Service Commission of West Virginia, and one to the FCC here in Washington. They bear witness to my frustration over several months that it took to resolve this matter, during which time the amount of money that I supposedly owed MCI uh, totaled to $84.47. There are still a few things that bother me about this, although in the end I did not have to pay MCI. I stubbornly refused, and it, this, uh, my letters will tell you what I had to say about that. In this day, when word processors make letter writing so much simpler than it used to be in the past, I do not think it was too much for me to expect that my letters should have been answered. Only those from the Public Service Commission and the FCC were. All I have seen in writing from either MCI or CNP came after the previously mentioned commissions began to inquire into the situation. In a letter sent by MCI to the West Virginia Service a Public Service Commission, a copy of which letter was sent to me and it's included in the things I've submitted. A staff administrator writes, and I quote, I apologize to Miss Simmons if an order for service was processed without her authorization. Well, I am Ms. Simmons, but this is beside the point. What bothers me is the word if. It is a not so subtle implication that I may have lied about the whole thing. I am also troubled to learn, according to the same letter, and again a quote, MCI's records have been purged of any account information whatsoever, end quote. And further in the letter, further on in the letter, uh, they say that C&P's records have also been purged, except for a notation made by a representative who spoke with Ms. Simmons in reference to MCI's charges appearing in her C&P bill for March. What is this purging of records? Surely it could not be a method of hiding unethical practices that occurred. They may have purged their records, but I have not purged mine. <laughs> my purpose in submitting my correspondence, and indeed my purpose for being here, is to help prevent this from happening to me again or from happening to others. In the past few days since I've been planning to appear here, I've been talking about this with people in the workplace. And I've been told by a colleague of mine, another teacher, I'm a public school teacher, that the same thing happened to him and the same thing happened to his mother. And they're still trying to correct their cases. And also one of my students said that his mother was a victim of the same thing. His mother, he said, made one call and got no satisfaction, so she simply <clears throat> let it go. Could it be, sirs, that this is what the companies who practice slamming hope for? Do you think they might hope that people will simply neglect to do anything about it? Surely there's something the Congress can do to safeguard the public against such unsavory business practices. For my part, I wish in spite of uh, what Mr. Schiff had to say, I wish telemarketing could be abolished altogether. At best, the tactic invades my time and attempts to make me shop at times that are not my choice. That's what this is all about, isn't it? Choice. I like to choose with whom I will do business and with whom I will spend valuable minutes of my time. I think those are pretty basic rights. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Simmons. Our final consumer witness uh, is Mr. William F. McDonald from Annandale, Virginia. Mr. McDonald. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for holding these important and timely hearings and for inviting me to appear. I prepared a written statement which I have furnished to your staff for the record. With your permission, I would like to summarize the most important parts of my statement. Yes, sir with not only my permission, but my enthusiasm. Thank you. 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, almost all Americans are affected by the telecommunications industry and its public policies. Since the onset of widespread government deregulation of that industry, the leading firms, AT&T, MCI, and Sprint, have engaged in a nationwide battle for the market share of the lucrative long-distance telephone business. Normally, our market system encourages healthy competition in the private sector among the providers of goods and services. The underlying assumption is that competition will inevitably prove to be, econo to prove to be of economic benefit to the consuming public. As a result of my experience, however, and that of thousands of other Americans, I now think that assumption must be questioned. Mr. Chairman, the purpose of my testimony is to bring to your attention my recent experience with MCI. As a result of this experience, I believe that MCI is currently involved, either knowingly or un unknowingly, in what are clearly unethical and possibly unlawful business practices, which work to the detriment of the American public. I hope that my testimony here today will help to eliminate these unsavory practices. In August of this year, I received an undated, unsigned MCI form letter thanking me for agreeing to have MCI become my long distance carrier. There had been no previous contact between MCI and me or my wife on the question of MCI being our long distance carrier. The form letter requested that I provide some basic information on an enclosed return address form for MCI's records. MCI's letter clearly stated that even if I did not provide the requested information, I would soon be switched from my present long distance carrier to MCI. The letter concluded by saying that if I had any questions, I could call the provided MCI 800 number. Mr. Chairman, neither I nor any member of my family had ever authorized anyone to transfer us from AT&T to MCI. In fact, I had never even been approached by, by anyone on the subject. I did, therefore, have some questions for MCI. I called MCI's 800 number and, would, and was put on hold for 10 to 15 minutes. Then I was disconnected. After two more similar unsuccessful attempts to complete the call to MCI's 800 number, I decided to call CNP. Following my explanation of the situation to CNP's service representative, I was told that many other apparently satisfied AT&T customers had recently called to make the same complaint as mine. The CNP customer representative assured me that a notation would be made in CNP's records to ensure that my long distance carrier would not be switched from AT&T to MCI. Nevertheless, on September 9th, while in the process of making a long distance call, I heard a recorded message state, thank you for using MCI. I immediately called the MCI operator and after several escalations in the level of my contact at MCI, I began to understand how the unauthorized switch in long distance carriers had occurred. According to the information I obtained, MCI uses telemarketing firms to solicit new business from non-MCI customers. The telemarketing firms are paid on a commission basis directly related to the number of new customers they develop. Apparently, there is no requirement with MCI, within MCI's procedures for the new customers to sign any forms or to do anything to document or confirm their desire to be switched. You will recall that the account is switched even if there is no reply to, M to MCI's unsigned form letter. As a result, there is no organizational check or in-house confirmation by MCI to verify that the independent telemarketing company's reports are honest and accurate. There certainly appears to be a strong incentive for the telemarketing firms to falsify reports, thus directly increasing their financial remuneration. Since the immediate result is to increase MCI's billing base, the falsified agreements may even be in MCI's short-term financial interest. Under these conditions, I believe a prudent observer could certainly question the motivation of the MCI officials 
charged with expanding MCI's business base to delve into the accuracy of the switched agreements. When I called MCI and explained what had happened, I was assured in no uncertain terms that someone at my number must have orally agreed to the switch. I explained that only my wife and I were currently residing at the number and that we had discussed in detail the switch following its completion. We were both certain that neither of us had answered such a call. I was subsequently told, in somewhat softer terms, that it must have been an MCI error. As I pursued the matter with the MCI representative, I was assured that it was not MCI's policy to generate new customers this way, and that if anyone in MCI's employ made such an unauthorized switch, it was grounds for dismissal. Notwithstanding this termination policy, no additional details were solicited of me, and no suggestion was made that anyone within MCI's organization would be called upon to explain how all this could have happened on my account. When I asked the MCI representative to switch my carrier back to AT&T, I was told that MCI could not do that. The explanation given was that all switching is done through the local telephone company and that only the receiving long distance carrier's request would be honored by C&P. As a result, I was required to contact AT&T and C&P to ensure I was reconnected with the long distance carrier of my choice. In a conversation with an AT&T representative, I was told that it would probably take 10 to 14 days to effect the switch back. Because I pressed on this, I was told that it could be done within the week, and it was. I understand there is often a charge for switching carriers. To date, I have not been billed for the switch, but should there be any charge under the circumstances, I certainly would expect MCI to pay. By letter dated September 12, 1990, I brought my experience to the attention of MCI's chairman, Mr. William McGowan. I have made available a copy of this letter with my written statement. With appropriate cover letters, I sent copies of my MCI letter to Judge Harold Green, to Mr. Sykes, the chairman of the FCC, to Mr. R.J. Ranelli, president of AT&T, and to Mr. Hank Butler, president of CNP. My letter concluded with the following. With this letter, I challenge you to initiate an internal investigation to determine just how widespread this unethical practice currently is within your organization. I would welcome whatever reply you or your staff deem appropriate. I received prompt written replies and follow-up telephone calls from AT&T and CNP. I received no acknowledgement or reply from MCI until after I was invited to testify before this subcommittee. On October 12th, I received a perfunctory letter from MCI, a copy of which I have made available for the record with my written statement. I have received no communication from the FCC. From the standpoint of a concerned consumer, I believe strongly that the telecommunications industry should be able to control and regulate itself. Without such self-control, the only other workable alternative may be tighter federal government control, a solution that causes me some concern and one that I'm sure is anathema to the industry. Forewarned is forearmed. This concludes the substance of my statement. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. As there is a vote presently uh, on in the House, and the members have roughly nine minutes left to go to the Capitol and vote, we will recess for approximately 10 to 15 minutes. When we return uh, with, to this panel, we'll begin asking questions. Thank you. The hearing of the Government Information Justice and Agriculture Subcommittee shall resume. The, um, uh, the public got a twofer on this deal. We got over there and found out there was another vote, uh, also one to close the Department of Defense conference, which is done for uh, security reasons, and that was necessary to vote on also. Uh, when we recessed, the consumer panel had just finished, 
And we'll now turn to questions. I'd just like to note uh, the subcommittee's appreciation to the panel for coming forward and also to those who have made complaints about this. In going through the files of our own Public Service Commission and contacting the Federal Communications Commission, I noticed, uh, for instance, that while there may be several hundred complaints on file at the FCC, what I suspect is happening is that there are hundreds, perhaps thousands more, who never complain who either accept it, who are perhaps confused, uh, say, think that they were, because they were slammed, they have to accept it, but that this is just the tip of the iceberg. And that's why we're particularly appreciative of you all, not only going through the procedure you went through, but also coming to tell your stories today. The first question I have is if I could just kind of poll each of you very quickly so that we get an idea. How many of the panel of three, how many had actually talked to a long distance company representative who was trying to persuade you to switch? Was anyone at the, had anyone at the panel actually talked to someone on the telephone? Ms. Sims, had you been contacted by the company? Through their telemarketer, yes. yes and, not, and so you, they had actually contacted you? Oh, and, yes, and, and not just the incident that resulted in this. Many times, I, I would estimate at least once every other month for the last two or three years. And each time you had told them no. Each time I've told them no. Now, did each of you receive something in the mail from the telemarketing company informing you that you were being switched? I don't recall that. I don't recall ever receiving anything in the mail. Well, I know personally we received absolutely nothing. It was not until the bill, the local telephone bill, which of course includes a long distance carrier, came when we found that it was so low that we began to ask questions. And then shortly thereafter, the questions began. We then we received our first bill from U.S. Sprint, our new uh, long-distance carrier. And did you have to pay a charge when you were switched, or in, in order to switch back, uh, either to switch or to be switched back? I had the same experience, I think, as Mr. McDonald. I can't speak for Ms. Simmons. But when we switched back to AT&T, we were credited for I believe it was the $5 for what it would cost to switch back because of the complaining and the talking to CMP as well as AT&T uh, and U.S. Sprint. They credited our account, so the charge came, but of course the credit nullified that. At any point in this process, did you sign anything authorizing a, a switch? No, sir. I never signed anything nor agreed verbally. No, no, I did not. In fact, I did. My uh, form came and asked for some information and asked that I return it with the, my signature indicating my agreement. And it clearly stated at the bottom, even if I didn't return the um, self-addressed postcard, that I would be switched. And I did not return it, and I was, in fact, switched. It's strange that even though, even though we're both uh, complaining about the same company, I don't recall receiving, I know I didn't receive anything like he's describing, asking me for a signature. Because the the representations that are made is that at least you're getting some kind of written communication, a no. card which authorizes the switch be made. At some point, that card is supposed to be on file with the long distance company that is doing the switching. That's we, we also did not, did not receive any uh, written notification from U.S. Sprint. Like Mr. McDonald as well, when we switched back to AT&T, I believe you, you mentioned that, we did receive a card which we had to sign authorizing our switch, our return to AT&T. But as far as from 18 to do a sprint, uh, we received nothing uh, written. It just procedurally, when I did switch back to AT&T, I talked with the um, uh, appropriate customer representative, and she agreed and took all the necessary information. At the conclusion of which she said, um, our policy is to have you confirm your desire to be switched back to my supervisor. Would you mind repeating that when I put her on the line? And I said, fine. Um, Somebody else came on the line and said, uh, are you um, confirming? And I said, yes, I would like to be switched back to AT&T. So there was on the switch back to AT&T, but there was absolutely nothing of that sort when I switched from, from AT&T to MCI. Did any of you either ever receive a verifying phone call from the long distance company that was doing the switching to double check and make sure that you had authorized them to switch you? No, sir. I no. never received any such thing. Were you ever harassed or threatened by a collection agency? <laughs> yes, I've included in the documents. I mean, obviously the, the definition of harassment can vary, but I've included in my document three such letters uh, beginning with simple 
uh, harassment in the term, terms that they would cancel our service and then eventually going to the one which was of dated July 31st, which stated that they were going to take, that there will be quote unquote legal ramifications uh, for, for not paying the bill, et cetera. So, yes. Um, I have just, uh, mine was so recent, I have just received the first uh, MCI bill and I have not yet paid the CNP bill in which the MCI billing uh, is included. So um, I expect that I will delete that and will proceed from there. I would hope that based on um, uh, the other gentlemen's experience that uh, I will not get it. But if I will, if I do, I certainly will continue to resist and well, Mr. provide McDonald, copies. <laughs> I would note that you noted in your testimony that it wasn't until you were announced as a witness for the subcommittee that you heard from the long distance company. I just want to say you've probably gone to the greatest lengths of anyone I've ever seen to make sure you get a response. Uh, <laughs> we're all here to be glad, we're glad to be here with you to get, make sure you got, finally got communication. All of you, I believe, have been in contact with the FCC at some point. Did you get a reply from the FCC? I did, yes. And how did you, and was it, and if so, was it satisfactory? Uh, yes, because really by the time I heard from them, uh, I had already been told by CNP that I would not have to pay the charges and my uh, telephone service had already been switched back to AT&T. So yes, their, their comments were satisfactory because it had already been resolved, really. But just so the record's clear, Ms. Simmons, was this the Federal Communications Commission that, because yes, you'd sir. also spoken yes, to West sir. Virginia Public it, Service? I, I wrote to FCC also. Um, I sent a copy of my September 12th letter to MCI along with a cover letter to the uh, chairman of the FCC. I have not received any response or acknowledgement of that letter. My experience was somewhat mixed. Uh, on April 29th or April 20th, I spoke with Kathy Neff at the FCC on the behest of uh, the local CMP telephone company and found that she was very helpful. She explained specifically what needed to be done in terms of an informal complaint and I, too, wrote to her a letter of 29 April. It's in the documents. Inclusive in that letter to her uh, were the dates and activities that had gone on, as well as a copy of the letter which I had also sent to U.S. Sprint in refusal, initial refusal of payment. Now, it, we did not receive, uh, to my knowledge, my wife tells me that, that we may have received something that is in terms of verification from FCC. However, we know for a fact that we did not receive anything from FCC if we had received anything at all until after our return from Switzerland, which was, in, which was in the first week of August. And after we had paid the bill, which we paid on August 6th of this year. So that means that there's a span from April 29th to August 6th at least when we'd received nothing from the FCC in any type. Now obviously we could have called, so we didn't do that. When, we, when I recall first noticing something came from FCC was when the company's CMP as well as U.S. Sprint sent letters to us in uh, middle of August and as well as late August, the 10th and the 17th, I believe, also included, that gave us a copy of rules that the FCC had sent to them regarding how they were going to go about investigating. And they happened to be the exact same two-page set of rules. So then I knew, obviously, that they were sending us a letter, these companies, because FCC had contacted them regarding our complaint. All of you complained after you were slammed. Do you think that, and from what you've seen talking to neighbors and friends, do you think others are going to this trouble? My experience uh, suggests, I've talked to a number of people, and I think that the it's just a uh, off the wall guess. I think the ratio has to be a minimum five to one people who are slammed and do not complain. Um, while I didn't include it in my uh, oral remarks, it took me at least four hours of time talking to various people. Um, I'm a resident here. I uh, um, spent 20 years with the federal government. I did inter, uh, uh, independent consulting. I, I think I know my way around um, a little bit, and it took me four hours. If, uh, if the average person in uh, Topeka, Kansas, or uh, St. Louis um, were slammed, one, I think probably they don't even know it. There's a lot of uh, times, unless you listen to that recorded message that says, thank you for using AT&T, or thank you for using MCI, and unless you're attentive to that, you wouldn't know it. When the bill comes, at least my bill, 
The uh, long distance carrier has a billing agreement with CNP. It appears at the end of your CNP bill and it just has a little uh, heading that says MCI or AT&T bill. If you look at the front page of the bill and take the figure off that, you don't even know uh, who your carrier is. So I think there must be uh, uh, an enormous multiplier effect of people who are slammed uh, who either don't know or who know and don't know how to respond or who try to respond and give uh, give up. I mean, um, I happen to be a very stubborn individual and I was going to see it through, but um, as I say, it took at least four hours of my time. Well, there's a final irony too because as you point out, you live in this local area, but if you live in Topeka, Kansas or Bridgeport, West Virginia or anywhere else in the country, it's a long distance call and the irony is you have to call Mm -hmm. presumably on the company that just slammed you to complain about them. Well, or you can dial the MCI 800 number and wait 15 minutes and then be disconnected. <laughs> uh, I know uh, Mr. McCandless has a, a time crunch, and so I'm, I have one more question, but I'm going to uh, turn to him for his line of questions. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm interested, uh, Ms. Simmons, in the, uh, the manner in which these conversations were carried on. When, when uh, you would pick up the phone and the individual involved would address you. Did they introduce themselves as representatives of MCI? How did they begin their conversation as far as the introductory part is concerned? In the very beginning, it would begin like, uh, Hi, my name is Susie. Are you having a nice day? <laughs> and then uh, they would say, I'm a representative of MCI and I'd like to talk to you about your telephone service. Usually there was this, uh, what I would call pseudo-courteous introduction and uh, informal, I'm Susie or I'm whoever. Kind of syrupy. Yes, yeah. very. So, so they represented themselves as being from yes. MCI. Yes, after that first... There uh, wasn't an insert there, I'm representing a marketing company working for no, MCI. No, no, that, since that I represent part. MCI as well as I can recall. <clears throat> now, as, as time progressed, you mentioned in your comments that the calls would come periodically during the year. Did, uh, did they continue to use the same general approach in yes. the introduction? Yes, and, some, and I know it hasn't been the same person because some of them have been male callers and some have been female callers, but it's the same pitch. I'm representing MCI mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. As um, well as I can recall. You mentioned that you had discussed this with a number of your colleagues at the uh, school. In, in that discussion, did they receive a similar type of call where it had the same general format? Hi, yes. I'm Susie, or whatever the name of the person yes. might be. Yes, that's, they indicated this to me. In, in those conversations, was there anything volunteered by them that uh, it sounded pretty good or they, they talked me into it or anything of that nature that would follow up from the general conversation of I received a call from a representative of MCI? The only thing that I have heard people say is I am so sick of these calls. <laughs> And I do think that maybe some people will just agree to it. I think by that comment, they're kind of indicating that it's easier just to say yes than to put up with it. Now, that's my personal opinion, but their comment seems to indicate this to me. So there could be an indication that by using this marketing procedure, uh, they were able to gain some customers. Oh, I'm, through, I'm through certain. Simply they, the, the attrition of the individual's uh, patients. I'm certain of it. Uh, Mr. Lehman, uh, if I understand your testimony correctly, there was uh, never a contact of any type between you and MCI until you received your bill. Well, it, uh, first of all, it was U.S. Sprint, but... Um, uh, I'm there, sorry, yours was Sprint? That's correct. Okay. There was phone contact asking us if we wanted to change. Uh, and two times pri prior to the change itself, both in late 1989 and in February of 1990. Um, my wife and I had discussed this very issue before the calls had even come uh, in terms of which phone company we wanted to go with. Uh, and we had stoutly said to ourselves that we wanted to stay with AT&T. The first phone call I answered in late 1989 and the second she answered and w both times we were in the same room together. So we know that we, we were saying the same thing, and we said politely that we simply did not want their service, which was why it was so astonishing to receive it. 
Right. So the answer was no on the phone. It was U.S. Sprint. And then you learned when the billing came that you had been transferred. That's correct. Because of the size of the bill, I had to call the CMP to find out exactly what had transpired. But the size of the long distance bill clued us that, uh, that we had been switched. Um, Mr. McDonald, I want to go back over yours for the record. You received a letter which uh, said simply that if we do not hear from you, we will transfer you anyhow. That's correct. And the letter contained uh, some type of a promotional, we can do it better for you. The general content of the letter was what? The general content of the letter uh, appeared to assume that I had responded positively uh, in a telephone conversation because the lead off was something to the effect that we thank you for uh, choosing MCI as your long distance carrier. Okay. Have either you or Ms. Simmons, have you been contacted in a similar manner by any other long distance carrier? during the period that you have had these experiences? Not during this period. I, I think that I may have been contacted by Sprint one time. But in the, our area, in talking to other people, MCI seems to be the one that is active in our area. Mm -hmm. Mr. Uh, McDonald? I don't uh, recall being contacted by any carrier within the last uh, six months. Mm -hmm. Mr. Lehman, you? Well, we were contacted uh, by MCI after this entire debacle had taken place sometime about a month and a half ago, somewhat incredulously, but uh, yes, we were contacted. Same type of pitch by phone, and obviously we said no again, and please don't switch us. So. The, uh, the concern I have here is, is one of being able to transfer a service without a written request on the part of the individual who is the ultimate bill payer when the service currently in place is um, to the satisfaction of the individual and uh, that that individual has in fact uh, re requested that service and it's being delivered. When, it, when the three of you talk to uh, the AT&T and C&P people uh, they said that this is just automatically done, that the electronic device is, is, uh, is activated, which takes you off of one carrier and puts you on the other without any verification of any type. Did I understand this correctly, Mr. Uh, I can answer somewhat in terms of our case, at least. Uh, speaking with CMP, when we complained finally, the gentleman on April 20th, uh, Mr. Gil Green, placed what he called an electronic blocker on our account, which would make it impossible, unless there was thorough verification, that we could be switched again, once we had switched back to AT&T. In the same day, later on, I spoke to someone from AT&T, uh, Ms. Carrie King, and she told me specifically that there had to have been a document which was sent to the local bill, to CMP, which contained our signatures, verifying that we desired to switch. And this is what I, in my letter to Kathy Neff on the 29th of uh, April, wrote and challenged these, this company to produce such a document. Uh, so that's, I believe, the document we received from AT&T when we desired to switch back to our original company. And we did sign that and send that in. But as far as when we were slammed, no document ever arose, no document was sent to us, and that was told to us that by CMP, that they had, by AT&T, that they had to have a document in order to switch us with our signatures. So they, weren't, they were never able to produce this document? Not to my knowledge. I've heard nothing of that, no. Ms. Simmons, do you have any similar? It was just about the same. Uh, the person that I talked to at CNP, and I don't recall the name, said, well, we're supposed to have a document, a signed document, before we do this. And she asked, could anyone else at your household have done this? And I explained to her there wasn't anyone living there but me and the cat, and I didn't think the cat had done it. So she, she did indicate that there was supposed to be a signature, but no one ever produced one. If, if that cat did it, we should talk to you about, <laughs> yes, <we should. laughs> about the talent of that cat. <laughs> Mr. McDonald? Uh, my understanding is that the transfer is done electronically, and whether they have a uh, signed uh, document or not uh, is, I guess, a, an option that their internal policies dictate, um, because I was clearly switched without them having a signed uh, authorization, although they had sent me one to sign, which I chose not to return, 
Um, upon complaining, I was switched back to AT&T, again, without ever signing anything, although at that point I did have to confirm to uh, the individual supervisor with whom I was speaking that I did wish to choose uh, AT&T as my carrier. So there was at least two people at AT&T uh, with whom I was required to speak. I'd like to thank the panel for coming here this morning. We've appreciated your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. McCandless. Uh, Mr. Towns. Question to you, Mike. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Simmons, once you switch, did you continue to get calls from other telemarketers? I got one other one from MCI uh, while I was in the middle of this process of trying to get uh, disconnected from them. And I told it, it was a, a gentleman, and, and I told him that I had been hooked to the service without my consent, and I said, don't you do it again. But I, from no other carrier, no. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Lehman, uh, you said that the size of the bill led you to believe you had been switched. Mm -hmm. uh, could you elaborate on that? No. Was it more or was it less? It was less. It's somewhat difficult to explain, but simply the, the size of the bill was less. Uh, it was only in the area of $1.46 to my knowledge because it, it only reflected the bill of the a and of AT and T in terms of long distance. Now our bills for CMP where I live come on the 25th of each month. And essentially what had happened was the switch had taken place about the 1st of February. Sprint says in a letter that it took place February 10th. I think it took place a little earlier. But regardless, that bill which we received from CMP on March 25th told of a long distance period of one week within which we made calls with AT&T from the 25th of, of February to the 1st of, I'm sorry, to the to the 25th of the 1st of the next month. Thereafter, the switch occurred, and we were now billed by outside by U.S. Sprint. U.S. Sprint, I guess, bills their own without going through CMP. And the first bill we received from U.S. Sprint, sure enough, did have, and I have it with me, have a, 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 the first call was made in the 1st of uh, February. So the reason why we were clued is because it was such a low bill in terms of our long distance call, and we knew that we had made calls after the 1st of February to Switzerland, and so it could not have been only $1.46. So essentially, the 146 represents the calls on the AT&T before we were switched between the 25th of January and the 1st of February. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, let me just thank you for coming, and uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I have no further questions. Mr. Schiff. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd also like to thank the panel. I'd like to go back and focus on one thing, and this may well have been covered uh, by the panel members, but I'm not <clears throat> sure I understand. <clears throat> I understand that all of the panel members were switched against their, no against their wishes and apparently even against their knowledge. Uh, if I understand correctly, two to MCI and one to Sprint, uh, U.S. Sprint, all from AT&T. Um, what I would like to know is, was there, to each panel member, was there a direct contact to the company to whom the switch was made, that is to MCI and to, to Sprint? I've heard about calls to CNP, I've heard about calls to AT&T, I've heard about calls to uh, the U.S. government and the FCC. I'd like to know what the response was to a call directly to the company that signed you up against your wishes. Uh, and, and would start with any panel member who wishes to start first. Well, um, I was given the form and it said you're going to be switched even if you don't return this. If you have any questions, here's an 800 number you can call. A form, call, form from whom? From MCI. Came in the mail. It said thank you for choosing MCI as your carrier. Please provide us with this basic information. Um, if you have any questions, um, call the MCI 800 number. I called the MCI 800 number. I waited 10 to 15 minutes. You get this music and recording saying all circuits are busy. Your call will be answered in the priority in which it was received. After approximately 10 or 15 minutes, I was disconnected. I called back two more times. I spent half an hour trying to contact MCI unsuccessfully. Um, at one point, I did get a, con a contact at MCI, and I was told in very clear and certain terms that I must have 
had somebody at my number authorize this switch. That was by somebody at MCI. That was by somebody at MCI in a very forceful way. When, when I did not back down, I insisted that there was only my wife and I and that we had discussed it and there was no question that we had not. Then they backed down and they acknowledged that it may well have been an MCI error. What, what did, if anything, did they do at that point? Um, at that point, I asked them to switch me back, and they told me they could not. They, they explained that the switching was done at the local uh, service company, C&P, and that requests were only honored by receiving carriers, and that they could disconnect the MCI service, but that they could not authorize C&P to hook me up to AT&T or to Sprint or to anybody else that all they could do would be, would be to disconnect me, which obviously wasn't the solution to the problem. So they so, uh, said I had to call AT&T and or C&P. So MCI, or an MCI representative claimed that they could not switch you back, even That's after correct. you made that request directly. That's correct. Uh, Ms. Simmons, may I ask you the same question, please? Yes, I called an 800 number and talked with a representative from MCI was told it was from the Baltimore office, and I don't remember the lady's name. Uh, she searched through computers and was unable to find my name on her files, but she said, I'll call C&P and take care of this, and I'll call you back in a few days and let you know what happened. And she did call back, and she said, it's all been taken care of. It was a mistake that you were hooked to our service and it's all been taken care of but I continued to get bills after that. But in your case, Ms. Simmons, the MCI representative claimed to be able to switch you back yeah, to Yes, she did not specifically say what she could or could not do other than just that, I'll, I'll take care of it, that it's been an error okay. and we can take care of it. And, and yes. claimed, in fact, that it was taken care of? Yes. All right. Uh, Sir, may I ask you the same Certainly. question? Uh, we received the bill of March 25th from CMP about, on or about the 27th. On the 29th, I made the first call to U.S. Sprint. I spoke to a woman named Angela. I did not get the last name. And she gave me the 800 number also. I called the 800 number as well. She gave me a number which I could call to verify which long distance company we were now on, which was U.S. Sprint. Uh, the same day, approximately an hour later, I called the 800 number again in U.S. Sprint to, re to talk to someone. And between these two calls, I had called CMP and asked them for guidance. I spoke with, at, at the next call with a U.S. Sprint representative named Carolyn Masters in Dallas, Texas, and told her that we were refusing payment and why, and asked her where, we, where could we send a letter addressed to them, and she gave us the address. And we sent the letter out of seven, on 7 April 1990, which is in the documents which, which I've included. So. And, and did U.S. Sprint, I'm sorry, maybe I didn't follow, no, follow okay. the end of that. Did U.S., what was there, what was there, the, the slate, you said you would not pay the bill. Yes. Did, I, did you request that they switch you back to AT&T? I had the same experience as Mr. McDonald. When I did that, they explained, Carol, uh, the person there explained that, that she could not do that, that they could only accept business, and that in order to do that, I had to get in touch with the local telephone company, and then I found out that we had to contact AT&T as well, so... I see. Okay. Thank if I, you. If I could add, Please. sir, you, you said that we all seem to go to our uh, local mm -hmm. carrier. I think there's a good explanation for that. The bills came from with my C&P bill. Uh, my AT&T bill comes separately. Uh, if, if it had been a problem with AT&T, I think my inclination would have been to go directly to them. But since the MCI billing was done through C&P, that seemed the logical route. Certainly, and I meant no implied criticism of calling any, either the local phone company or AT&T or, or, or the, uh, any government agency. The point of view that I was coming from and would like to just take a moment to express is assuming, and, and we have more testimony coming, uh, on this matter, but assuming that these were accidents of some kind, the question that, that occurs to me is what would a company do that is involved in some kind of an accident? Uh, uh, how do they respond? How do they try to repair it when they are, uh, when they are contacted? And that's why I wanted to focus directly upon, upon those companies if you had contacted them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Thank you, Mr. Schiff. Ms. Ross Lettman. Thank you. I have one final question for the panel. Having been through all of this experience, do you have some specific recommendations for this panel as to what could be done to avoid this kind of problem for consumers in the future? I, I'm, let's take as a given that there will most likely continue to be telemarketing and active telemarketing. It's a very intensive industry, a very competitive industry right now. What kind of safeguards would you suggest based upon your experiences? Mr. McDonald? Well, I would like to suggest that uh, the unauthorized switches um, be the, the individuals somehow be provided with some sort of uh, compensation, um, albeit punitive, from the company that did it. Um, because as I pointed out, and I think the other testimony uh, confirms, um, we've spent a good deal of our time trying to rectify what I think clearly is not just an ad hoc error, but is a matter of policy. And it seems to me that if the only um, penalty that is assessed to the companies that are doing it, and if, in, if my estimate of five to one is in fact uh, uh, correct, the practice pays, and the companies are making a lot of money. And if all they have to do is deal with those who complain, um, I think they're going to have to, uh, they're going to continue, and I think they're going to have to be somehow penalized um, beyond uh, the cost of switching back at no cost to the consumers, those that, that take the time and effort to complain. I would like to suggest that as the airline industry does, if you get bumped off a seat, um, you get a minimum of, I don't know what it currently is, uh, some airlines give a free round trip ticket to any place in the, in the country, some give a hundred dollar cash uh, check. I think something of that nature uh, would make it um, painful enough so that at least uh, uh, they would have to think twice before they uh, initiate this on a policy basis. Ms. I, I would like to see uniform standards set for all telephone companies that there must be a signature and then the, per the company who is to do the switching should be required to call that person to verify that the signature was indeed theirs and that they want to switch. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sarconi, any suggestions? Well, I would like to also reiterate what the panel has said. I I agree that the practice pays. I mean, you're speaking with the person here who, after making all the complaints, eventually paid the bill of $36 because just being tired of all the letters and the possible legal ramifications. Uh, even for those who complain, the practice still pays for these companies as well. I think that Mr. McDonald is correct. That there should be some sort of penalty assessed regarding the illegal switching. I'd also like to say that the billing seems to be a little bit of, bit of a problem between the local companies and the long distance companies. Unlike Ms. Simmons, at least for, for us, in the CMP local telephone bill, also inclusive is our long distance ca carrier, at least when we were with AT&T. U.S. Sprint did bill us separately. However, we did not know that. In other words, if the bills were separate from each of the carriers, even AT&T, I think it would be a, a, a boon to those who were paying the bills because automatically one would know this is my long distance carrier and one would not have to spend four hours and that's not an, in, uh, an invaluable estimation of time trying to assess with whom one is dealing. Uh, and thirdly, I would say that there has to be a, a much better means of verification. There has to be at, le at least contact, as in the case of Mr. McDonald, with some type of supervisor or person at the very least, and at better, I would say, as Ms. Simmons pointed out in this age of technology, there needs to be some type of written verification. Uh, and if requested, as we did, there should be someone who could send us a copy of this said verification, which was never sent to us. So, and Do you believe this verification should be given in advance of the switching, the written verification? I believe so, yes. It's my personal. It, it, it occurs to me now, and I'm not a technician, but it occurs to me that it wouldn't be too difficult to uh, send a letter uh, requesting confirmation. I can appreciate that the paperwork involved, somebody at the break suggested that there was uh, 2.8 million legitimate switches, uh, and to require paperwork on that uh, is obviously a, a costly and, and time consuming. It seems to me it wouldn't be too difficult to send a letter saying, we understand that you've switched, we'd like to have your confirmation, um, please dial this 800 number and key in this code. 
the way you do at the automatic teller machines, which will indicate your confirmation of your desire to switch. Um, that's uh, computer generated, takes about a minute or two of the consumer's time, and then uh, would be recorded. Uh, and I s suspect that with technology, the uh, call from uh, the telephone number from which you're calling could be recorded, the date and time could be recorded, and the code number, and you would then have at least something to go back to the telephone company and say, who confirmed this? And they might not have a signature, but they could say it was confirmed from, su from such and such a number at such and such a time on such and such a date. Good idea. Hi. If I may just yes, add sir. one more thing. I'm sh it's very true that I'm sure there are a lot of good switches that have occurred. However, we wouldn't be here if there weren't a number of illegal switches that have occurred. And in our situation, my wife and I, to begin the process of challenging other than what we've done would probably require a discussion with a lawyer. I mean, that is time and money more than anything which we simply do not have. And I think that was the main impetus eventually of, of paying. Uh, we had probably pretty much gone to as far as we could. Maybe we could have gone more further with regard to the FCC. but. We, didn't really, we don't have the time nor the money. I think that's why a lot of people eventually pay these bills or just accept the switches outright. And if that's occurring, then I think there needs to be more verification on part of the companies. Well, I want to thank you very much because you've spent uh, some time and money to be here and, and given up your time to educate our subcommittee about this problem. And I want to assure you that our subcommittee is going to take an active role in overseeing this. Uh, if, if you're also looking at the panels to come, we have the State Public Service Commissions, the Long Distance Carriers, the local carrier to talk about their perspective, and we'll finish up with the Federal Communications Commission. So you've kicked off, I think, the inquiry that needs to be made, and we thank you very much. Thank you. The next panel will be consisting of state public service commissions, and we'll have We'll hear from Mr. Thomas M. Beard, Commissioner of the Florida Public Service Commission, on behalf of the National Association of, Na of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, or NARUC, and Ms. Maishi Blair, Customer Relations Division Director of the West Virginia Public Service Commission. Uh, Ms. Beard and Ms. Blair, we're delighted to, to have you. If you, if you would, uh, since I've got you standing, yeah, as, as the case with the previous panel, we swear all witnesses in so as not to prejudice any witness. Do you have any objections to being sworn? Yes, sir. You would raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to so help you, God? I do. I do. Mr. Beard, uh, if we could begin with your testimony. Uh, we appreciate your being here. Good morning and thank you. Nice to come to some cool weather from Florida. Yeah. I come to West Virginia, you can see the leaves turning, beautiful well, foliage. I was going to ask you if it helps my testimony. My mother's family still resides in Oak Hill, West Virginia. Is that uh, has uh, any bearing? After redistricting next year, that'll help your testimony okay. a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you as a representative of the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners. Obviously, on an important issue, slamming. NARUC recently endorsed the idea of providing the customer written notification of any changes in service. The long distance company would be required to send a customer written verification of a change within three business days. The customer then would have the opportunity to stop any unauthorized change before the change was made. The NARUC proposal would keep the changeover process simple for customers who wanted to change but would not go so far as to require that written authorization for a customer be on file before the change was made. Any long distance company respond, uh, responsible for fraudulent or erroneous changeover in our proposal should have to bear the financial and administrative burden of correcting the problem. In Florida, let me give you a little bit of live history. During the first five months of the year, our Division of Consumer Affairs received 129 complaints against U.S. Sprint. Many of these complaints also involved Network 2000, a marketing company which had contracted with U.S. Sprint to promote residential and small business service. Network 2000 used what is referred to as independent marketing representatives in a multi-level marketing method. The salesman would not only receive commissions from the long distance usage of his customers, but also could sign up additional marketing representatives and receive commissions on the usage of their customers. Almost sounds like a pyramid. Many of their promotions were at county fairs, shopping malls, and flea markets. Many of their marketing practices can best be described as deceptive. 
A fast-talking salesman promised one of our investigators who was acting as a potential customer that the subscriber line charge would be removed from his bill if he signed up. As you know, the subscriber line charge is imposed by the FCC and goes on everyone's bill. Others have offered free telephone credit cards, chances to win a prize, and other items of interest. One woman told our staff that she signed a paper only because the saleswoman assured her that it was only to show the boss that she was doing her job and talking to potential customers. Naturally, she was slammed. And let me suggest to you that being a public service commissioner is not prevention for slamming, because I have been slammed as well. It just didn't take me quite as long knowing some resources to be able to get the problem resolved. We should have put you on the previous panel. Yes, sir. <laughs> I could have served either place. U.S. Sprint has now implemented, with our helpful assistance, programs to address the problem of unauthorized orders and the number of complaints has declined. The proposal, which is pending approval before the Florida PSC, includes verification of orders received by Network 2000. U.S. Sprint initially contacted 100 percent of the customers. The percentage will ultimately drop to 50 percent and then to 25 percent as the problem appears to resolve itself in our eyes. The company will continue to reimburse the customer for any charges associated with unauthorized change. In-house training will be conducted for customer service reps and marketing reps, and the marketing reps will be monitored to assure that they do not continue turning in unauthorized orders. The result on a short-term basis with U.S. Sprint is that from a October 89 high of 37 complaints in that month, they are down to a low of May 90, four complaints, and that four complaints tends to be about the average that has gone on in the last couple months. So we can see some significant change as a result of uh, direct oversight. Similar problems were reported with National Communications Network, or NCN, which is a firm engaged, uh, that engages independent agents or contractors to resell MCI service. We chose not to approve a certificate for NCN because we found them operating in Florida without a certificate prior to our approval. My understanding is that they are going to come back to us with a, a proposal similar to the U.S. Sprint proposal to see if they can now get certified if they're willing to behave uh, as I would term it as good corporate citizens. From January of 1990 through October of 90, we have received 161 complaints. 50 involved MCI, 47 were U.S. Sprint, 52 were spread among the other 18 certified long-distance companies, and oddly enough, 12 were blamed on the local exchange company for switching that they did not wish to occur. The rate this year only appears to be slightly lower than last year, indicating that oversight obviously needs to occur on more than just U.S. Sprint. Our staff is preparing a proposal which would place uniform guidelines upon all inter-exchange carriers in Florida uh, for monitoring purposes, et cetera. This problem, as with any other situation where deceptive and illegal practices occurs, requires a combination of solutions. Rules and laws are necessary, but oversight, enforcement, and penalties at the grassroots level is what I feel will ultimately reduce the problem. I don't want to suggest to you that it would eliminate the problem completely, because to do that may be more cumbersome and expensive than the marketplace can stand. We in Florida, want our customers as well as the other customers of the nation to enjoy the benefits of competition and to be able to freely choose which competitor they want to serve them. We hope that your actions, the actions of the SCC, and the actions that we intend to take can resolve that problem. Thank you very much. Our uh, next witness uh, will be Maishi Blair, the Customer Relations Division Director of the West Virginia Public Service Commission. Ms. Blair. Good morning. First of all, I would like to thank this honorable subcommittee for the opportunity to be here today on behalf of the customers in West Virginia. Thank you. As director of the Commission's Customer Relations Division, my job is to process informal complaints. Uh, we began tracking uh, the issue of slamming back in 1989. At that time, we found that we were receiving, for the year total, approximately three calls per day and 17 written complaints. From 1990 to date, we have received 48 written complaints, 44 of which have been lodged against MCI. In all 48 instances, AT&T has been the carrier of choice. The people who have alleged that they have been slammed in our state uh, give us complaints such as the following. 
I'm old, I'm elderly. When someone says to me, I will give you $5 for you if you will uh, change your service, five free, five dollars worth of free calling, to that individual, that means something. So the individual will switch only at a later date to find out they do not like the service that they have been switched to. They've had problems in trying to recapture uh, their service from AT&T. They will lodge complaints with our commission against the local telephone company, as well as AT&T, and as well as against the carrier that uh, they have uh, been switched to. We've also had instances of where people have been called time and time again at night during the evening hours uh, concerning the, uh, their long distance service. Uh, during those times, they have indicated clearly to the caller that they do not want their service switched. However, the, call has, the, the caller has switched the service anyway. We've had uh, instances where individuals have come to us and complained because they have been threatened with actions from a collection agency. We've also had uh, people who have uh, stated to us over our toll-free lines and through written correspondence that they have been called obscene names by the telemarketers just because they refused to switch their service from their carrier of choice to a competing carrier. What we do in these situations, because we are, uh, have limited manpower, is that we suggest to the individuals, put your concerns in, writings and most, in writing, and most certainly we will investigate it for you. There are so many people who call in on the phone who are old or otherwise incapacitated who do not take the time to put their concerns in writing. Those individuals, they fall through the cracks. We aren't able to serve them as we wish we could. However, those who follow up their concerns in writing, we're able to uh, assist them and we have been most successful in that all of our complaints today that we've received on an informal basis have been nipped in the bud at the informal stage. Now our commission has a two-tier process. First of all, we start out on an informal basis because we like to build that rapport with that utility uh, because we consider we're in here, we're in the situation for a long-term ride. We're not here uh, just for this issue of slamming. We have other concerns that uh, we must process with this utility. Uh, the complaints that we have lodged on an informal basis with the one who has been indicated as the greatest uh, perpetrator of slamming, MCI, they have been successfully resolved to date. Uh, then if the customer is not uh, happy with the result on an informal basis, that customer has the right to file a formal complaint with our commission in which we can take some type of action on a formal basis. Should the carrier decide not to follow what we decide to do on a formal basis, our commission may impose fines on the carrier. When I received the information from this honorable subcommittee as to how we would indicate to you what we would do with the problem of slamming, I could not say anything other than what I would like to be done because my commission has not said other than uh, we think something should be done but haven't, hasn't quantified yet what we would like to be done. From my perspective, because I work day to day with these individuals who have been slammed and because I have read every piece of correspondence that that commission, the commission I work for, has received, there is a recurring theme that's echoed in each piece of correspondence. Make them have us put it in writing before my service is switched. Uh, that is, from my view, what I think would be appropriate. First of all, I think it would reduce the number of complaints that we have received at my commission, and also it would give me a basis where I can hold up to the customer and say, you have signed your John Henry, you know, you've committed yourself. Now, it's okay if you've changed your mind, but for purposes of your complaint, you did commit yourself. Then if, I, if the uh, carrier cannot produce it in writing, I can go to the carrier and say, you have wronged this customer. Please rectify the same. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Blair. Um, Mr. Beard, Ms. Blair spoke about particular types of people who were susceptible to this. Have you, do you have any observations? about people, is there one group or, or several groups that tend to get slammed more than others? I, I haven't seen anything specific there. Obviously there are some problems uh, with the elderly uh, from a telephone aspect. We've seen a lot of our activity, as I said, at flea markets, fairs, 
uh, where they, they will literally say, would you like to sign up for the grand prize drawing? And you sign up for the grand prize drawing, and you haven't. You signed up for the grand prize of getting slammed. So uh, we, we see a lot of variety and a lot of innovation by these companies. Uh, innovation is normally good, but... Now, are you seeing, uh, speaking of innovation, are you seeing any evidence of particularly coercive telemarketing practices or instances of inappropriate language? We have not seen that, to my knowledge. Ms. Blair? Uh, yes. Uh, on our toll-free line, and I just happened to answer it uh, one day, an individual called and claimed that they had been called an obscene name. Uh, when I spoke to the individual, I said, well, that type of complaints you're making, most certainly we do not tolerate that because it goes to question the quality of service that that carrier is providing, whether it is your carrier choice or not. Please put your concerns in writing and we will investigate it. Well, that particular individual did not put her concerns in writing, but another individual did. And I would hesitate to uh, say the name that the individual says that she was called, but if you could grasp the meaning from what I am going about to say, <laughs> is that uh, the individual said that she had been called what you would uh, sometimes call a female dog. And she put it in writing. Uh, this uh, particular complaint was lodged with MCI because MCI was the one that was indicated as the person who had employed the telemarketer and the telemarketer had said, stated this to the customer. Uh, the letter received from MCI went through its usual investigatory steps and uh, explained in detail what they had under, undertaken to find out who the individual was. Uh, I accepted that answer on an interim basis, but from my perspective, no one has the right to abuse someone else on the telephone simply because you do not want a switch in your service. From my perspective, I wanted a name. I wanted action taken. I did a follow-up letter to MCI, and the response I received to my follow-up from MCI indicated that because the trail was so cold, when that person initially lodged the complaint, put it in writing, and then they tried to identify the telemarketer, because the trail was so cold that they were unable to identify that person, but again, MCI uh, said in its letter that they were very sorry that that had happened and they do not tolerate such instances. In, uh, uh, it's, is it your observation that much of the telemarketing is being done by a separate contract agency to the long distance company? Ms. Blair or Mr. Beard? Yeah, that's that's what we're finding. And in addition to that, even that company is is hiring the independent marketing rep, who uh, is on a commission basis, and and that's even based on usage. So the quality uh, control that can be exercised by the long distance com company is sometimes very distant, isn't it? Can can be at least two or three levels removed. What, uh, in your opinion, has the FCC handled the slamming problem adequately so far? <laughs> Mr. Uh, or Ms. Blair, you want to start? Uh, from my perspective, um, and consider where I'm coming from, I'm looking at it at a myopic view. Because if you have something that's in written form, I can hold that up to everybody and say, you've committed yourself. I'm looking at suppressing those complaints and seeing to it that the customers in West Virginia are uh, satisfied that they've come to their commission and we, as a group, have projected a positive image for our customers. So when there is nothing in writing in place, I'm only looking at it from my perspective. But uh, as far as if the FCC would go forward and say put it in writing prior to any switch in service, that would be from my perspective what should be done. It's my understanding they have not done that. So from my perspective, my myopic view, I'm looking at the situation because I'm the one taking those complaints. I'm saying they have not gone far enough. Let me, it, it's a, it's a, from my perspective, a little tougher question because they, they need to take some action. They're moving forward, but, but in the world of greater competition, I think they need to move, move carefully. And let me tell you why. This problem isn't going away. In many states, Florida is one, we have reserved the local toll area for the local exchange company. In Florida, in January of 92, that's going away. That means that the AT&T's and the Sprints of the world is going to be able to go in and compete with the Southern Bells. And that means we're going to have round two of world wrestling slamming, I guess. Uh, we want to be careful to not, to, to not control competition. 
And that's why we don't advocate completely having it in writing in advance because it can make it so cumbersome that the, the incumbent, if you will, maintains a virtual lock on a uh, market segment. So I think the SEC is taking the appropriate approach and looking at this thing carefully. Uh, and we spend enough time at odds that it gives me pleasure to say that I think they're doing this one carefully and not, not running roughshod, which occasionally does occur. Let me add a disclaimer here. I'm saying from my perspective. Now, my commission has not formally come up with what it feels that the FCC should do. I'm just looking at it from my perspective. We're the ones handling the complaints, and this is what we have in place at this point in time. Uh, I am um, knowledgeable of the fact that, and I will agree, that the telecommunications industry is very dynamic. It's ever-changing. Uh, something that's going on today, such as slamming, may be gone tomorrow. So from my perspective, I'm only giving you my personal opinion, what I'd like to see, because I am there in a position taking those complaints. However, I'm not opposed to the FCC moving at its pace that it is, trying to fashion something that's going to satisfy all the concerns. What the FCC is involved with here is that it is having to balance everybody's interests. Not only those West Virginia customers, those customers across the nation, the telecommunications carriers who are in a very competitive market, they're having to foresee what's going to happen in the future. So consider what I'm saying only from my perspective, that is what I believe. Ms. Speaking of perspectives, Mr. Beard, is the position you just outlined, is that your position or is that NARUC's also? That uh, is NARUC's position that, uh, as I understand it, you currently have to, the IXC has to have written authorization and be able to present that upon request. We're saying beyond that, you should have, they would have to go and verify within three days. But we would not require written permission in advance of the switch occurring being in the hands of the local exchange company. But you are saying, though, that the switch might go ahead and occur, but at some point that company has to have, the long distance company has to have a written authorization on file. I think that's what you're saying. That right? is correct, and that's my understanding of the way it's supposed to be now. We're saying go beyond that and have an author, have a, a contact made, physically made, call that individual back and say, did in fact you want this to occur? That takes it out of the hands of the marketing rep, the marketing company, and puts it in the hands of the inner exchange carrier who we're holding accountable and responsible. But uh, my understanding from the previous panel was that in, that had not occurred in, that, in the cases of those three people at least. I don't doubt that for an instance. There's, there's a lot going on that, that should, that, and that's my concern. As I said, we can pass all the laws and rules we want. It's ultimately how much enforcement can we put at that level to, to find the, the bad guys and then, in our case, kick them out of the state. And, and a, just a couple of quick questions and then I'll turn my time over. Uh, who pays for the verification, in your opinion? The long distance company that's doing the, uh, doing the switching? If they, if they want the business. And do you have a problem uh, in your state uh, assigning the cost for switching back? Who pays for that? The, the cost for switching back on an un... Uh, on a slammed... Person. On a slam goes to the company. All costs, both administrative, uh, any overhead, all costs associated with that slam or switch go to the company. So Absolutely. And what is the practice in West Virginia, Ms. Blair? Uh, usually the cost that you refer to, a conversion cost, uh, sometimes that customer has been billed for those costs, and that is a part of the complaint they brought to my commission. When I see those practices happening, I will immediately contact the uh, carrier and state, you know, we want this straightened out. Uh, and in fairness to MCI, again, every time that we have contacted them, they have come full circle with regard to our request and have settled it on an informal basis, uh, paying for those costs, offering an apology, and undertaking whatever steps are necessary to rectify the wrong that has been committed. My concern is those individuals who do not take the time to come to our commission, to contact someone they perceive to be in a position of authority and ask for help. For other people, $5 may not mean a lot, but someone who's elderly on a fixed income, $5 could mean eating. And some instances we've had that local telephone service has actually been terminated for charges incurred. In those instances, those elderly and infirm people, the only contact they have with the outside world is their telephone. So from my perspective, that is the reason why I'm saying I 
had this preference. But if I can clarify one thing just briefly, this is the tip of the iceberg. Uh, I'll give you an example. In my case, I travel a lot. I make calls from pay phones, from hotel rooms, and I have multiple carriers listed on my bill because I may not choose to dial my digits through, and I just go ahead and let it be charged to an ITI or, or some other form of carrier. So I'm used to seeing lots of different names on my bill, and it, I may have been slammed and not even know it if I'm not careful and don't watch it. Yeah, and, and Ms. Blair, I would ask you the same thing. You note that you've received 48 written complaints in, uh, this year, but that you get approximately 10 calls per day. And I'm just Somewhere in, in the neighborhood. Let me explain if I could further explain. Uh, we have toll-free lines that come from all over the state of West Virginia. So for each line that we have down in our office, each phone that's on the hook, there are six toll-free lines coming in on that particular phone. Depending on the number of kept customer representatives who are taking those phone calls in rotation, it uh, gives the number of complaints we may receive per day. That's an average. It depends on what we're receiving on that toll-free line. A lot of times people will call us in with things that fall strictly outside of our jurisdiction. We must be courteous to them and explain that we do not have the authority to help them out. But that's only a rough estimate. There are lots of people who call our toll-free lines and cannot get through because of the volume of uh, complaints we receive on a daily basis and given the fact that our commission regulates so many utilities. <coughs> Mr. McCandless. Based upon uh, the testimony of our previous panel, it appears that the key issue is one of how to verify or in some way administratively um, place a check and balance in, in, in uh, order for a, a justifiable change. If I understood your testimony, both of you have the authority within the framework of your state to require this to take place. It, did I understand correctly? Yes, sir. G given a policy by your respective governing boards? Yes, sir. And uh, to what degree have you proceeded in that direction? Ms. Blair? Uh, as I explained earlier, we have a two-tier process. I'm involved in the informal process. And since I have been so successful with the relationships that we do have with our inter-exchange carriers operating in West Virginia, we've nipped it in the bud. But with those files that I have uh, received, I'm holding them into abeyance. If it gets to the point where I feel hey, commission, step in, do something, do a general investigation. I have within my authority as the division director to bring that issue to the commission's attention. Also, the individual may file a formal complaint. That would put the issue squarely before our commission. At the present time, my commission is monitoring the situation. Although we did write a letter and comments in support of something must be done or something further could be done. Uh, on behalf of the customers, and that was uh, sent to the FCC. Do, do I understand then that uh, West Virginia has not reached the point based upon what they consider to be the, uh, the taking advantage of people to implement this as a part of your public uh, commission uh, requirements for phone companies? And if I could qualify that. Whereas I'm concerned I feel that there is a problem. I most certainly... Well, I, I understand that, uh -huh. but I'm talking about the governing body taking this on as a policy. They have not At this yet point in time, no, they have They not. have not decided that this uh, has reached a point where it is going to be required <coughs> that something be uh, in writing. Right. Would, would the gentleman you... Did the state of West Virginia or did the Public Service Commission file any, uh, uh, anything with the FCC on this issue? Uh, I do believe, Congressman Wise, on February 23rd, and it's a part of the attachments to my written testimony, that we had comments in support. Now, those comments do not outline what action we think the FCC should take, other than we suggest that something should be done to alter what's in place. Thank you, Jim. I guess I'm a little confused. Uh, I, t I, I relate to my experience with the Public Utilities Commission in California. And since this is a intrastate type of situation, even though there are cross-state boundaries, the telephone companies are regulated in California by the Public Utilities Commission. The rates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, 
you're you're attempting through your letter then to have uh, the FCC do something along this line on a national <coughs> level instead of maybe moving in the direction of a state level is this, is that my understanding of what we're talking about here? Uh, I did not prepare that the document. I just attached this exhibit to to show what we had done uh, with the FCC or, you know, our inaction with the FCC. Uh, we, under our uh, statutory authority in the code, we do have the right to uh, look at a utility's unreasonable practices. We can do a general investigation. Um, from, I think, from a, a larger point of view, what you're looking at here, or maybe the FCC we want to take a look at, is consistency, to know that the uh, playing field is level for everyone. You expect minimum standards from each person. And maybe that is the respect they're looking at to fashion something to do something in that regard. So the, uh, the West Virginia Utilities uh, Corporation was thinking in terms of standardizing some activity on a state, uh, on a nationwide basis rather than individual state. I, I think perhaps that is the direction yeah. that uh, my commission is looking towards. Mr. Baird, what, how would you respond to this? Florida never advocates the FCC taking an action in our place, I assure you. We, we get in trouble yeah. sometimes for doing just the opposite. We have taken, uh, in addition to the complaint process, we have taken uh, several steps. We implemented the guidelines and things that we said U.S. Sprint had to do. We did that immediately with that company because they were our biggest problem. We have, as a result of that, pending shortly a proposal from staff to, to implement the vast majority of all of those, uh, I call them guidelines, but quite frankly, they're not their rules that they would implement if they're to be an interchange carrier in Florida. And the third thing we have done in one instance where we did not find it satisfactory, we ran a company out of Florida. And we feel that, we quite frankly feel that we're going to have to do the enforcement because it's going to be at the grassroots. The FCC doesn't have the resources to send an investigator. So it's going to have to be us. And if we're going to enforce it, we'd rather enforce our rules, to be honest with you. Correct me if I'm wrong, but way back when Judge Green did his thing and uh, they separated out the system, I remember receiving in the mail from the telephone company that serves me a form to choose which long distance uh, company that I wish to have, which I was required to sign and return to the phone company. Uh, is my memory correct? That, that's correct. It's, and it was actually done basically on a, an exchange by exchange basis, pre-subscription. You choose the care you want. And uh, once that occurred, then the art of slamming began. Uh, you had your carrier and the competition began for, for pre-subscribed people. Okay. Since I was required to do that in order to make the selective process, um, I, I have difficulty understanding why I wouldn't be required to do a, a similar thing to change what I had originally done so that it would be on file. Is well, there something here I'm missing? Uh, yes, sir, a little bit. You, you're correct, you were contacted. But something happened whether you responded or not. Either you responded and gave your choice, or if you didn't, then on a random basis from the carriers that were operating in your area at that time, you were assigned a carrier. In other words, it was basically picked out of the pot, if you will. If I, if I didn't return the if card. If you did not respond. But, you, if it, I re, but if I returned the card. Then you got who you asked for. Yes. But then if I were approached as the three people in the panel prior to this panel were in whatever manner, uh, my difficulty is I, there is on file with the basic telephone company my ultimate, my first decision, which I have not changed. In and, some and instances. So that company then agrees to, uh, to go ahead and connect me with another company without any change in my original uh, request or yes, decision. There, there are those instances. Uh, in as many instances, there is nothing on file because there was no response and they were randomly assigned a carrier. Is that, is that the, uh, the hole in the dike? Well, I... I now, let, me, let me put it this way. We have 100 people listed on a sheet. 35 of them sent the card in like good citizens. The other 65 did not. So as you explained, they were assigned random. 
Uh, are these names available then for purposes of slamming? I don't, I don't know that they're available. The local exchange company, I don't know that they would publish a list. Say MCI would call it, I'd like a list of, of who everybody has that's, got, that's on AT&T, for example. Uh, I think it's probably a little more random than that. But the, quite honestly, even though you sent your card in, the local exchange company will switch you upon verbal request by an MCI, an AT&T, a Sprint, a Microtel, any of those. Is it worth the, uh, uh, let, me, let me rephrase this. Based upon what we have been talking about here and the numbers, has the time come to change this policy on a, in Florida and in California or wherever it might be? To a degree. And, and that's where I come back to the NARUP position, that there would be a required verification. Uh, and, and I think our position would be from the phone company, and I use that term in the local sense. Uh, MCI calls Southern Bell and says, I want Tom Beard put on MCI service. Uh, MCI, in my opinion, should be responsible for paying for the effort of Southern Bell calling Tom Beard and saying, did you in fact authorize MCI to do that mm -hmm. within three days? Is a written request on file too much of a, uh, an administrative problem to require of a long distance phone carrier uh, change? I don't think it's an impossible burden. I think it is a significantly increased burden in a competitive marketplace or in a marketplace that is trying to become competitive. And I think it can stifle competition to, to some degree. I'm not, I can't quantify it. When I apply for a phone, I have to fill out a form and sign my name before yes, they will install a phone. Um, to, to me, there's a somewhat of a likeness there since we have separated the long distance system from the domestic or local phone system. If I'm required to have one to put a phone in, then it would appear to me that it would be necessary to have something similar for the long distance service. I, I, I guess the, the analogy I'd make is that you only have one choice on your local exchange carrier and you won't be switching them that often. It's not a competitive marketplace. Uh, in my instance, for example, uh, my wife was called by a company that actually aggregates and uses certain times of day for AT&T, certain times of day they use Sprint rates, certain times of day they use the MCI, whichever is the most competitive. She made that choice and went with it. Now, I could have gotten home later and said, oh, Lord, no, I don't want that, and switched back. I mean, and there you have two companies facing expenses uh, based on my uh, marketplace behavior, if you will. And I think the difference is the phone company is a monopoly environment and, and the inter-exchange market is hopefully becoming competitive. Thank you, Mr. Beard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Towns. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Beard, you mentioned um, the number of complaints of slamming. Uh, how many uh, total number, I guess I would ask, in terms of out of how many phone users, I guess? We have approximately 4 million access lines in Florida. You've got 161 from January of 90 to October of 90 that called the Public Service Commission. Now, uh, how does that extrapolate out to the number of problems we've had? Uh, I don't have the numbers on how many have called Southern Bell, how many have called AT&T, MCI. These are the formal complaint process. So as in relationship to the 4 million access lines, it's relatively small. Yes, sir. Right. That's what I was just thinking. You know. So, But you would have no idea in terms of the other areas, in terms of the amount of complaints there? No. I. Yes, I'd be delighted to yield to the chairman. Just a quick question. West Virginia, is, is Ms. Blair, Alan, has an informal process where you call in and you don't put it in writing and you try and get resolution that way, and then you go into the formal process. Does Florida have a similar? There's, are the 161 the formal complaints or the, the informal? The 161 represent an 800 call and or a letter or beyond. Uh, those, are, those are complaints that we've received in-house. Would they be considered in your system informal? At that point, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Blair, you mentioned people switching and uh, for financial rewards, you said, you know, sometimes $5, sometimes $10, and then uh, switching back because of dissatisfaction. And my question is, is this really slamming? Uh, 
I couch my written testimony as slamming and related issues. Uh, whereas it would not be a true instance of what you would say per se, slamming, because the customer sometimes may have authorized, but because the customer is not allowed to go back to the carrier of his or her choice, to me that's a related issue. They're like being held hostage. Mm -hmm. So it may not be truly slamming if you're looking at it from unauthorized switching, but uh, it's a related issue from my point of view. Also, I would like to expound on that. There have been instances uh, someone had indicated earlier through their testimony where people have been positioned outside of uh, grocery stores or whatever the situation may be and tell someone, uh, ask them a question like who uh, hit five home runs this year? Person comes up with a name. Good, you've won the prize. Sign here. Person signs, the service has been switched. Or someone will say, hey, all you have to do here is to sign your name and receive $30 worth of free calling. Things like that are happening. Uh, when someone makes a selection and they're not uh, immediately returned to the carrier that they would like to have at that point, that causes me some concern. But the bigger concern from my perspective is when an individual, uh, unbeknownst to him or her, has been switched without his or her knowledge and cannot return to the carrier of choice. Mm -hmm. you know, with the fact that they were paid, and you know, I sort of had a little problem with that. But anyway, I understand in terms of the light that you're viewing it. Uh, what type of formal action have you taken against carriers? Um, what is the fine structure, if there's a fine structure, you know, what do you really do if you find someone that's actually guilty? Okay, uh, what I'd like to do at this point to further explain is to elaborate on what uh, Congressman Wise has stated. Our informal process involves also uh, written complaints that come into the office as well as people walking in off the street because of we're invasive in Charleston and its uh, environs. Uh, what we do at that level when they come to my particular division, we have nine operating divisions there at the commission. We try to resolve it on an informal basis without going to formal hearing. If a satisfactory answer is not received, then the person may invoke the formal process through filling out a uh, form and oftentimes I will assist this, uh, that individual. Um, and then they will go to hearing, take evidence. Uh, they may present this evidence before an administrative law judge or the commission itself, should the commission, our three commissioners, think that the facts and circumstances warrant their action because it may be a policy-making uh, uh, hearing. But any, anyway, I've said all that to say that uh, first we start out on an informal basis and it's being resolved at that point. But after the informal basis has run its course and the individual is not satisfied, they may go to a formal process, which would involve me collecting the records that I have accumulated to date on an informal basis and accompany it with the person's formal complaint where they would lodge it with our executive secretary and it's put on the commission's docket of open cases and given a case assignment. I think what I'm really asking, is there a fine or for repeat offenses yes. I and mean, what generally happens to me? Yeah, yeah. After evidentiary hearing, the commission has within its authority under Chapter 24 of the code to impose monetary fines. Uh, say, for instance, the commission writes an order and says, uh, into exchange carrier, we found your practice to be unreasonable. You've had your day in court. We listened to your e evidence, and we've listened to the evidence that we have pursuant through our staff's recommendations. We have come up with this recommendation in the form of an order. We would like for you to do this. If that utility does not do what our commission says, then the commission has someone who has violated its lawful order. Therefore, the, uh, the code gives us the authority to impose monetary fines upon this carrier or anyone else that we find in violation of our lawful order. Mm -hmm. Okay. And did you want me to yield? I'm glad to yield to you. Uh, very quickly, uh, and Mr. Baird or Ms. Blair, either one, uh, and perhaps Mr. Baird, and then uh, you can comment. Uh, do the states have the authority to simply require a written authority before any kind of switching can be done? And, and I guess the question keeps occurring to me, if the states have this authority to ban the type of promotions Ms. Blair's talking about, somebody outside a supermarket, you know, with the question or the, or the incentive or whatever, uh, 
has this been done, Mr. Beard, in, uh, around the country? And uh, Ms. Blair, have, uh, have there been any limitations in West Virginia to restrict this? We, we have the authority intrastate. Uh, and you have to be careful there because you're electing, you can, in, in theory at least, elect an interstate carrier and an intrastate carrier. Have any so, states gone, Have any states banned uh, uh, this uh, type of activity without written permission? We have, we have banned a company from okay. coming into Florida. Well, I'm what I ask. Uh, the, the, the question, I guess, and, and I don't want to impose on Mr. Townsend's time here, the, the real question that comes down bothers me about this is that if we've got a problem out there, you know, if, if the state of Florida is troubled by it, if the state of West Virginia is troubled by it, why in the world don't those states take action and, and prohibit switching unless there's written permission given, one, and if it's a problem with regard to these gimmicks, tricking people and doing things, why haven't they uh, uh, prohibited those type of gimmicks from being used? We, we have taken action. We do not think taking the action of requiring written verification in advance of switching the service is appropriate in that particular marketplace. That to date is our position. That's not to say that we may not see enough of a problem to change in the future, but we think that we are taking the action in Florida necessary to solve our problem. Well, what about the rest of the country? Any state requiring it? I do written not know permission? the answer to that question. You not in your organization you're not aware of any state that requires written permission before any type of switching can take place. Mm -hmm. Not to my knowledge. I, I wouldn't be able to answer one way or the other. Yes, sir, I have, no knowledge. have you banned the gimmicks in West Virginia? Uh, that type of action, we would not condone it. But that type of action that, that I believe that your question is going to is that what the commission would investigate pursuant to a general investigation. We'd haul in all the inter-exchange carriers operating in West Virginia, have an evidentiary hearing and take evidence regarding what we should do or what practice we could say would be reasonable or unreasonable given the circumstances. We have not done that at this point in the does, game. Does the commission have the authority to do it? I believe we would under our general investigatory oh, powers to do that. All right. On that note, let me just follow up just uh, one, uh, one other question, Mr. Chairman. Are there any people or groups who may be harmed by requiring written authorization? Any, anybody that might be hurt by doing this? And the reason I ask that because there seems to be some reluctance uh, on the part uh, to uh, state that this should happen. Anybody would be harmed if we requested that? I think the answer to that question is yes. Uh, the question really is to what degree and the, the person that ultimately would be harmed is the, is the end user because competition doesn't exist. We in regulation at least try to think that regulation is only a surrogate and that competition is the best answer. And to the extent that you add additional regulations, impede competition, you increase prices. And that's the end user that pays those prices. It's a poor answer perhaps because I can't quantify for you to what degree. Yeah, Ms. Blair. I think that it would, in certain, under certain circumstances, have a stifling effect on competition because uh, for the same reason why people don't bother to write in their complaints to my commission, uh, you can use that argument as to if someone wants to go with a competing carrier, they may not feel like uh, writing it or putting it in written form to authorize this switch. So on the one hand, again, I go back to I'm looking at it from a myopic view, from my perspective, uh, what I would like to see, uh, that's because of the complaints we received. And it seems like to me it would just totally eliminate all the complaints that I, I receive, have received to date. On the other hand, you're looking at it from the customer, it might have a stifling effect to the customer who would like to switch but doesn't want to go through the bother. So I can see it from both sides uh, where it may be uh, uh, harmful in right. some regard. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for your courtesy, and I realize I have no time to yield back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Schiff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief uh, because of the hour and the other panels that, are, that I know are waiting to testify. I would just like to ask our witnesses about one area. Uh, at the beginning of the hearing, I defended at least the concept that there's a role for telemarketing in our society. I'm not sure, but I think I was spanked by the school teacher for doing so. <laughs> um, in, it, in any event, um, I still am, am not willing to say, even though it can be an annoyance, that it shouldn't exist. I think there is a place for it. But it has to be a proper place, one in which uh, abuses are controlled and, and uh, harassment uh, is not permitted. Um, what I'd like to know is, in the states of West Virginia and Florida, if the witnesses know, 
is there already in existence laws which regulate telemarketing, regardless of what the subject is? Is there a, is there a general telemarketers are permit, must do this or are not permitted to do that, regardless of what the uh, product or service is that is being telemarketed, I, if you happen to know? I would venture to say that yes, we do have such law in West Virginia, and that would be handled through our uh, Better Business Bureau or perhaps through our Attorney General's office, which is separate and apart from the PSC. Having had virtually all of my experience in public utility law, I cannot say only other than I venture to guess, yes, we would have something mm -hmm. like that in place. In, if, I, if I may stay on the subject of West Virginia for a moment, because the subject, assuming that there is some kind of telemarketing law or that it would come under consumer protection, mm -hmm. um, some kind, the fact that the subject matter of these calls is telecommunications, is that ultimate, does that in West Virginia mean that your agency is responsible for it and would not fall under the jurisdiction of any other agency that would deal with telemarketing? Uh, under the code, I do know of some instances where because we have jurisdiction in a matter, it does, uh, it falls outside of someone like consumer protection's uh, sphere of authority. Uh, in those instances, I would uh, say again that our commission, my commission, could do a general investigation of the problem and fashion some type of guidelines for all carriers operating in the state of West Virginia. At this point in time, we have not done that. Mr. Beard, may I ask about Florida again, if, if you're aware, sir? We have some in telemarketing that are not in our purview. All, there are also some federal things as far as automatic dollars and, and those kind of things. Uh, the reason we're involved in it, and the telemarketing aspect is not what, per se, we get involved in. What you have is one regulated entity asking another regulated entity to take an action, and that's where we get involved. You have a long-distance carrier asking a local exchange company to switch one of their customers over. And that's where we come in the front door, kicking and screaming. So this is a matter that's somewhat unique to telecommunications and other, other telemarketing laws, if they exist, may not apply directly to this situation. I think the telemarketing laws still apply to this situation. It's just in addition to that, we have some oversight. If they were not regulated, obviously we wouldn't be well, paying attention to it. You, you've discussed very well the situation about what would happen if written re authorizations were re required. It would, it would suppress some problems, but it could create others. For in the state of Florida, for other telemarketing, is, written, is a written confirmation required? That is, if someone calls and asks me to place an order uh, from a department store, are they required to have that verification in writing before they can uh, send it through? No. Uh, what, what does occur, though, is there is the, I guess you'd call it the 72-hour grace period, uh, where, uh, and that applies to all marketing, uh, knock on the door type, everything, where mm -hmm. they can change their mind right. and rescind that request, if they know about it. That's but, the first thing. But Florida has not chosen, as far as you know, to require written authorization for other kind of telemarketing verification. Is that right? That, that would be my understanding. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Following up on that just briefly, uh, Mr. Beard, but is this situation, I gave a lot of thought to this uh, a few days ago preparing for this hearing, is this situation somewhat different than me sitting at home with my mail order catalog with a toll free number or home, home TV shopping where I do an affirmative act, I have to go to, the, I go to the phone and dial and give them a credit card number to charge this to versus somebody calling and soliciting me and then, then it gets unclear what my response may have been. Maybe I said yes, maybe I was vague, maybe I was confused, or maybe I said no, and, I'm, and I wake up switched. The, there, switched and slammed. That, uh, that tough is combination. Yeah. Yeah. And dunk, that, yeah, and, dun <laughs> and dunked all together. <laughs> that is, I started to bring my basketball with me today. Uh, that is different from what you described. It's more akin to what happens in Florida when you get a phone call selling aluminum or vinyl siding for your home. What then distinguishes it further is at least if you're going to sell me aluminum or vital siding, one, you've got to come to my house, and two, you're probably going to want either a check or a credit card number, which means that I have to give you something that shows you, in fact, that I, I, I gave my consent in some form or fashion. An affirmative act. An affirmative act. Uh, I don't think we want to ultimately uh, kill telemarketing. It may be an inconvenience, and in my home, I am the telemarketing suppressor. When they call, my wife hands me the phone, and I suppress it rapidly. Uh, that's that's just the way it, you know. I think it has to work in our in our uh, business community environment. 
Well, with the chair, with the chair. You do have uh, good West Virginia genes, I can tell. <laughs> chair, you for one minute. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to point out that uh, this is not precisely on point, but for example, I'm telemarketed, uh, as we all are, uh, by uh, places where I already have an account. And uh, they know me, they know my account number, and they're asking me to buy some additional product from their store or some additional service that they offered. And uh, there's, if I say yes, uh, there is no... Uh Those that really need the help to most fall through the crack. And that statement has just stayed in my head. It's just reverberating around. I, 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 what do you really mean by that? And who are you talking about? Um, it's been my experience just uh, manning both our toll-free line and uh, dealing with the written complaints that we do receive on an informal basis. A lot of times when people do call in, they're the elderly, they're the old, they're the uneducated individual who cannot, uh, while I would say, because I've been through college, uh, reduce your concerns to writing, put it in writing for me. They do not feel quite, quite comfortable with doing that. Or they cannot, because of their physical limitations or their age or whatever, communicate to me effectively in writing, so they don't bother to do that, or if they don't have anyone there to help them. Unfortunately, because of the staffing that we have in my particular division, we do not have the manpower, or I should say woman power, because I supervise the all-female division, we do not have the woman power to uh, take these calls and concerns that when someone calls in over the telephone. The only thing, because we're limited, uh, personnel is that we take emergencies such as life-threatening situation, a gas leak or something of that nature where life and limb is immediately in harm. So when I say that these people fall through the cracks, I most certainly am positive that there are people who cannot express themselves well in writing and will say, oh, well, whoever receives this on the other end will laugh at me and just don't even go through the trouble of taking up for their self. Even though that uh, what we would like is, you know, I've outlined in my written testimony uh, what steps we we ask for that they do. If they would simply send us a bill and put on our I challenge it, that would signal me something is askew and, and I would start an investigation. Some people just feel that why bother or they're just not able physically to do that, to take that step. Thank you very much, but that really bothers me, so... Uh, it does me, too. Yeah, thank you very much. Your testimony. I thank the panel very much uh, for your, your being here. I know each of you had to sacrifice some time and travel to be here, but apparently somebody's... I've just been switched or slammed or dropped or something. Um, <laughs> Is that what they mean when they say, don't fool with the microphone, I guess? <laughs> but um, we do thank you very much for being here and, and uh, giving us the benefit of your experience. You. Next panel will feature representatives of two long-distance carriers. We have Mr. Eugene uh, Eidenberg, the Executive Vice President of MCI Communications Corporation, and Mr. Merrill Tutton, Vice President of Consumer Services, AT&T. Since... Uh, both you gentlemen are standing. If you have no objections to being sworn, if you would raise your right hand. You swear that you will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. We appreciate both of you being here. The chair would note for the record that uh, U.S. Sprint was contacted and, and declined the opportunity to be here. They may or may not submit uh, written testimony for the record. Uh, Mr. Eidenberg, why don't you start? Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, I'm tempted to say I'm pleased to be here, but on the other hand, I think the way I ought to phrase that is I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak with the subcommittee. Um, but I do regret, actually, and uh, say this with uh, total sincerity, I regret that this subcommittee 
meeting and hearing is uh, necessary in the first place. So to that extent, I'm, I'm not pleased to be here. I also want to begin my remarks by uh, saying to the subcommittee publicly what I said to Ms. Simmons and Mr. McDonald personally and directly after their testimony, and that was to offer them a, an apology uh, for any inconvenience and any difficulty that they incurred because of their interaction with uh, our company. I want the subcommittee to know in as clear and a direct a form as I can state it that it is not MCI's policy, nor is it in our business interest for customers of other long distance carriers to be moved to MCI service uh, without their permission, and without their authorization. Uh, it is, among other things, a public relations disaster. It is also terrible business. We are in this business and fought very hard and very vigorously to get into this business for the long term. It is in our business interest to build positive, long-standing relationships with customers. And there is not enough revenue in the near term, whether Mr. McDonald's estimate of a 5 to 1 ratio or some other number uh, is correct. It is not in this company nor in any legitimate company's uh, interest. Uh, there is not enough short-term revenue to justify the kind of practice uh, that has been implied might be uh, in our company's business interest. With that as backdrop, I would also like to ask uh, the Chairman's indulgence and permission to uh, provide for the record uh, affidavits uh, regarding large numbers of MCI customers who have also unfortunately experienced the, uh, the unauthorized switching uh, that uh, was represented on the panel uh, this morning. Certainly. We've received some of those affidavits, I believe, already. Uh, without objection, they'll be made part of the record and any others you care to submit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What I want to do is summarize, as the Chairman requested at the very outset of the hearing, uh, some general remarks about our process, about our practice, and about the context in which the events that uh, the committee is investigating and looking into take place. I've indicated it's not in our business interest, nor is it our business practice, uh, to deliberately move people without their permission. I want the subcommittee to know that we do verify 100 percent of our telemarketing sales. That is to say, usually within an hour of a telemarketing call being made and a prospect indicating their willingness to move from their current carrier, typically AT&T, because AT&T has approximately 70 percent of the market. When you make 100 telemarketing calls, the odds are 70 of those calls are going to be uh, to AT&T uh, customers. Uh, within an hour, typically, of that initial sales call, a verification call is made from a verification staff that is separate from managed differently than and is physically removed from the site of the telemarketing call. I also want the subcommittee to know that neither the verifiers nor the telemarketers are paid on a commission basis. Never have been. We do not pay our telemarketers on a commission basis. They are paid on a salary basis. I also want the subcommittee to know that when these unfortunate and I hope you understand how unfortunate I believe these are. When these unfortunate complaints are made, we pay the cost of, of the customer's cost of switching from their current carrier to MCI and the cost of switching them back to the carrier of their choice. It is our policy that within 90 days of the initial switch, for any reason, there does not have to be an assertion by an individual that they were switched against their will. They may have made an absolutely affirmative choice to use MCI. But if any time in 90 days from that moment they decide they want to go back to another carrier, they have the right and the guarantee from our corporation that they can do that and we will pay the cost of the switch. What I'm trying to say is we put in place, we think, a system which necessarily and appropriately, and as I know the central concern of this subcommittee, addresses the consumer's rights and the consumer's preferences. It can't possibly be in any of our interests in this industry to engage in practices that leave irritated, frustrated, angry uh, consumers 
uh, in our wake. To that end, it may be worth the subcommittee's understanding that the proposal for a written letter of authorization, which has been made in writing by AT&T to the FCC and which has been the subject of uh, queries by the subcommittee this morning, is a remedy that serves AT&T's business interest. Make no mistake about it, this proposal will have, as Mr. Beard from Florida suggested, very serious and negative consequences with respect to the ability of competitors to AT&T uh, to grow their market share uh, in this very competitive marketplace. I speak in behalf of a company that does the most telemarketing. The reason that commissions have reported higher absolute numbers of complaints about MCI's telemarketing than some other carriers uh, is very understandable. We have used telemarketing quite aggressively and quite successfully for the last several years as a way of reaching the consumer in America to explain the alternatives and the choices they may have in this marketplace. When the written letter of authorization was first discussed, it was in fact a requirement. At the time, Mr. McCandless, you talked about the equal access process when the balloting occurred. There was a written letter of authorization uh, required at that time. We, along with AT&T, petitioned the FCC to remove that requirement because of its barrier to consumer choice and because of the obstacles to wider competition that it presented. The FCC concurred in that recommendation and removed the requirement that there be a written letter of authorization signed before the conversion or the switch could take place. We still request of our telemarketed customers that they sign a document and return it to us. We also notify them that the documents, it is not necessary to sign the document in order for uh, the conversion to take place uh, pursuant to FCC uh, policy. The fact is most people don't return the signed document, the signed letter of authorization. In fact, in our experience over several years, approximately 70% of the people who have been telemarketed, who are happy and uh, pleased customers of MCI, uh, do not return the signed document. So if, you, if, if public policy were to install that requirement, it would have a very significant depressing effect on competition in this marketplace. So AT&T's proposal, it appears to us, is in their business self-interest, not in consumer interest. We have proposed to the FCC a series of actions uh, that ought to be considered by the Federal Communications Commission to provide common standards to guarantee the integrity of the telemarketing activities in our industry. Because we share this subcommittee's obvious concern and view that there ought to be consumer protections in the telecommunications telemarketing activity. And fundamentally, there are four or five, and I'd like just briefly and conclude my statement, indicate what the elements of, of such a program might be. Number one, there ought to be mandatory disclosures in all sales contacts from long distance companies. Sales representatives must be required to identify themselves, identify the service they are selling, and disclose to the consumer the fact that their long distance carrier will be switched should they purchase the service. There should be no ambiguity in the consumer's mind about what they're being asked to do. And if there is a promotion being provided by the company that's making the telemarketing call, and our company does, as does AT&T and as does Sprint, from time to time offer telemarketing promotions, that is to say, if you decide to use our service, we will give you five or $10 or some finite amount of free uh, or reduced rate calling. It ought to be indicated that in order to get the benefit of that promotion, you will be switching long distance carriers, that it is not simply an opportunity uh, to take advantage of the promotion in a very limited way. Secondly, there ought to be monitoring. Carriers ought to, market, uh, ought to monitor their telemarketing practice to ensure that there is compliance with the standards that we're describing and discussing here today. The mandatory disclosure the common script. We would even go so far as to indicate and to suggest that there ought to be a common script across the companies so that any customer or prospect who is telemarketed hears the same things first 
whatever the particular products or pitch might be after that. But monitoring is essential to ensure the company is enforcing uh, these practices. Third, verification, the issue you've spent the most time on this morning. All sales should be verified by a separate telephone call from an organization that's physically removed and under a different management than the people who are managing the marketing or sales side to ensure there is no even implied incentive and they should not be paid by commissions uh, for the obvious reason. There should also be mandatory minimum disclosures in the verification call, including clear reiteration of the fact that the consumer's long distance company will be changed if the verification is confirmed. And by the way, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, when we verify, we ask the customer or the prospect either for a social security number or a date of birth, which can then be used as some additional evidence if a complaint ensues later. And we get lots of complaints, but they represent less than one half of 1% of the telemarketing contacts we have with the prospect base out there, less than one half of 1%. If we have a date of birth or if we have a social security number, if there's a confusion, a complaint, or a change of mind sometime after the 90 days, we can at least use that to confirm with the customer that there was a verification call because that verification data only comes at the verification call, not on the sales call. Finally, there ought to be audits. All carriers should be required to hire an independent auditing firm. We have recently retained the services of Arthur Anderson, but all carriers should be required to hire an independent auditing firm to examine the carrier's practices and to certify that those practices conform to these standards or others as may be required. If the audit reports identify discrepancies between the standards that ought to govern telemarketing in this industry and the actual practices being followed, the carrier should be obligated to correct those practices within a specified period of time. And if they are unable to correct the practices within the specified period of time or do not correct the practices, then they should be required to stop the activity until such time as full correction is put in place. Finally, there ought to be free and convenient return to the carrier of choice. When a consumer says that he or she has been switched without authorization, carriers are not, as your earlier witnesses have testified, are not able to return that consumer to his original company. It is an, art, an odd artifact of the policies that are currently in, currently in place. We can call the local exchange company and tell them to switch John Doe from Carrier X to MCI. But if John Doe comes back and says, I didn't, I didn't want to be switched, or I've changed my mind, or it was somebody else in my family who authorized the switch, and I've now, we've now decided as a family we don't want to use your service, we don't literally have the legal authority today to do as easily on the back end what we were able to do on the front end. Therefore, we believe that policy change ought to be made so that the consumer, the consumer has no additional obligation or inconvenience to which he or she's going to be subjected in order to get back to the carrier uh, that he or she wants to be. I also recommend, not necessarily as a part of these standards or practices, but I also recommend for the subcommittee's consideration, um, uh, and this may be appropriate when discussing with the FCC later today, it might be appropriate to get a factual base of what the actual practices in the industry are today. That is to say, uh, we believe at MCI, we truly believe that we have put in place standards of control and management that can lead to the kind of telemarketing activities that I think everybody on this subcommittee would, would want to see in the consumer marketplace. But whether we have them in place today or not, it might be useful for the FCC or some appropriate agency to do an audit, to do a survey, to provide this subcommittee with a baseline of information about what the actual practices are on the criteria I've suggested and any others that the subcommittee would like to see uh, examined as the information input in deciding what recommendations uh, you care to make. With that, I appreciate your giving me this much time. And of course, after uh, Mr. Tutton speaks, I'm pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Eidenberg. Uh, we've heard from MCI Communications Corporation. Now we'll hear from 
Merrill Tutton, Vice President of Consumer Services with AT&T. Mr. Tutton. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for the record, my name is Merrill Tutton. I'm AT&T Vice President of Consumer Services. And like the other members of the uh, panel, I'd like to thank you also for the hearings on this important topic, consumer fraud. I have responsible, I'm responsible for all of AT&T's residential consumer services. And it is in that capacity that I first became aware of consumers being denied their choice of long distance carrier, a practice known as slamming. Let me begin by giving you one example of that fraud from the kinds of letters I see every day. An 86 year old woman in Connecticut, terminally ill with cancer, gets a telemarketing call asking her if she'd like to sign up with MCI. She tells the representative that her daughter handles all of her business affairs. Shortly thereafter, she gets a letter from MCI and learns that she's been switched without her approval. Now, this isn't the first time that this has happened to the family. The woman's daughter was also slammed. And now I quote from the daughter's letter. What gives them the right to do what they've done to both me, my husband, and now to my mother? I dread the thought that my mother may have to now endure the long-term harassment that we have had to endure. I think that's substantiated by what we heard from the consumer panel earlier. This is not an isolated instance. Time and time again, consumers are being switched without their authorization or their consent. In the last six months, more than 90,000 AT&T customers have told us that they were victims of slamming. And it is particularly distressing that many of these consumers are elderly or non-English speaking, particularly Hispanics. This situation has created significant confusion, inconvenience, and expense for consumers. Consumer groups, and I personally find this situation intolerable. And whatever you may hear to the contrary, 90,000 consumers can't be wrong. This is indeed a consumer issue, make no mistake about it. Choice is a fundamental right of consumers. Consum consumers should have the right to choose their long distance company without becoming the victim of fraudulent marketing practices. That is why, back in January, AT&T filed a petition asking the FCC to amend its rules governing how consumers select the long distance company. Under our proposal, all long distance companies, including AT&T, will have to obtain written customer permission before notifying local telephone companies of a change in their long distance carrier. To date, more than 30 national and state consumer groups, state commissions, and state attorneys general agree with us and have contacted the FCC in support of written authorization. These include the Conference of Consumer Organizations, the National Association of State Regulatory or State Utility Consumer Advocates, Consumer Action, the Oklahoma Corporate Commission, the West Virginia Public Service Commission Consumer Advocate has formally supported us. And in fact, the American Association of Retired Persons, ARP, forwarded to the FCC nearly 400 letters from its constituents, all were victims of slamming. Now, AT&T's proposal should not be a burden on the FCC or any company because the FCC rules today require that the long distance companies take prompt steps to obtain written authorization. However, there is no requirement to file written authorizations with the commission now or under our proposal. The only change is that with our plan, long distance companies will be required to have this written authorization in their files before making the switch. Now this will not place a burden on consumers either. Under our proposal, consumers can still call their local telephone company directly if they wish to change long distance companies just as they do today. You've heard about an alternative proposal by MCI for resolving this issue. Well, personally, I'm glad that MCI has finally acknowledged its slamming problem, a problem that thousands of customers, national and state consumer leaders, and AT&T have complained about formally since January, January of this year. Unfortunately, MCI's proposal doesn't go far enough. Indeed, their proposal is a recycled set of practices that they have been talking about 
since last March and which clearly have not worked. Most significantly for consumers, MCI's proposal fails to call for written authorization, a proactive act on the part of the consumer. AT&T's position is that the surest and simplest way to ensure consumer protection against slamming is to put the control where it belongs in the consumer's hands. The FCC has within its power to resolve this situation, but it has not acted. We realize the Commission has many important items on its agenda, but instances of consumers being harassed, duped, and denied their choice continue to escalate. We urge the FCC to approve our proposal because, clearly, consumer support is overwhelming. We're encouraged by this committee's interest in this consumer issue and are anxious to work with you and the FCC to take whatever steps are necessary to stop these outrageous acts. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Tutton. I have to say that chairing this particular panel, I feel like I'm chairing uh, something off ESPN, uh, perhaps the Road Warriors versus Hulk Hogan in the telecommunications <laughs> arena. Uh, yeah, live from the Omni. But uh, we do appreciate both of you being here, and I do want to say one, one more time for the record that we had also uh, extended to U.S. Sprint, who has been a subject of uh, mention in, this, in these proceedings today, an invitation to appear, and they declined. Whether or not they'll submit written testimony, I don't know. Um, Mr. Eidenberg, we'll start with you, and I know that uh, I think that the discussion actually will probably elicit a lot and we'll have a lively uh, uh, interchange with all of us. Mr. Eidenberg, starting with you, you testified that you verify 100 percent of your telemarketing sales. My question is, is that from what period? Uh, when did that start, or has that always been the practice? Um, we, it has not always been the practice uh, to verify 100 percent. We started verification of 100 percent in 1988. I can't tell you precisely when. I think it was after the second half, sometime in the second half of 88 on all 99 and all of 90 to date. And when you say verification, is that a telephone verification? Yes, it is, sir. Uh, and so that is someone calling back to that house saying, did you want to switch? Exactly. And what, uh, do you run into problems with that? Uh, for instance, uh, what if someone is not home or you call my house and you get my son as opposed to me and he says, well, I guess if dad said that, that's fine. It works both ways. We do run into problems with it. Um, that is to say, um, as I suggested in my opening statement, uh, there are occasions when one family member receives the telemarketing call and indicates a desire to make to purchase the service and uh, shortly thereafter a verification call comes and another family member answers the phone um, and indicates they had no desire to buy the service that's one form of of confusion uh, when that happens the verification the sale ends uh, on the other hand we also have circumstances where verification uh, calls can be made and there is un there's a lack of clarity on the verification call uh, there's an indication of some positive response uh, and the, tel the verifier is left with some degree of uncertainty. Or there are occasions when there is no uh, nobody home at the time the verification call comes, uh, even after repeated attempts. Uh, so it's not a perfect process, but we do attempt to verify 100 percent before completing sales. What do you do in that situation where no one is home? I will want to confirm this for you, but it is my belief we do not install the customer until we have verification. Would you check that and yes. just supply it in writing to the uh, committee? I appreciate I that. Um, now, two of the witnesses that were here claim that they had never received any kind of verifying call. Uh, did they fall through the cracks, or what happened? No, there are there are. If they, if they received a telemarketing call and did not receive a verification call, then clearly an error occurred. Um, in one case, I think it was Mr. McDonald, if I recall, he claims that he never received a telemarketing call, call in yep. the first instance right. um, and found himself uh, billed for MCI services. There are occasions when there are clerical errors, even at the local exchange company carrier. And I'm not in making this comment. Let me assure the chairman and the members of the subcommittee. My purpose here today is not to point fingers to other individuals. It's our responsibility as a corporation to run a telemarketing activity of, uh, of complete integrity. Uh, but I want the subcommittee to understand the complexities of this process. Uh, we have evidence and cases of individuals uh, who were not telemarketed, a la Mr. McDonald's case study. Uh, but we are moving literally hundreds of thousands of names 
on a weekly basis between our company and local exchange companies all over the country. 30% of the telephone lines and numbers in this country have some kind of change associated with them every year. People move, they order new phones, they decide to have an unlisted phone, um, they build a new home and move in, whatever. There is a huge amount of transition and, and activity around telephone numbers in this country. So we are constantly moving huge volumes of information and numbers back and forth with the local exchange company. It is possible there could be a clerical error occasionally at the local exchange level where somebody might have called and ordered a calling card from MCI, but not our dial one service. And they were installed as a dial one customer by the local exchange company in, in error. So there are multiple kind of avenues through which the kind of experiences you heard testified to here this morning could occur. In, uh, uh, in, uh, you testified also that none of your telemarketers are on commission basis. That's correct. Is that always been the case? Yes. So, so we're talking at least for the last three years then? Yeah, as long as we've been telemarketing. But is it also true that your telemarketers uh, are on a are usually contract agencies? That is true. Uh, roughly speaking, about 80 percent of the telemarketing calls made in behalf of MCI are made by outside firms with whom we contract. Would that just in, and then would it follow that 20 percent are made by MCI Correct. employees? Directly? Correct. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to parenthetically underscore that with respect to the 80 percent. Um, it is our responsibility to manage that relationship, that vendor relationship, very closely. Um, and to the extent there are any problems uh, in telemarketing, uh, it is our company's obligation to fix those problems. Now, you, I'm assuming then by your statement, you're saying that definitely none of the MCI employees doing telemarketing are on a commission basis. They're on a salary basis. Is, but can you guarantee that none of the te contract agency employees, or indeed it might be subcontract agency employees, are on a commission basis? I don't know that there are any, um, literally a statement of ignorance on this point. I don't believe, but I don't know that there are no subcontractors. I don't, I don't think that's our practice. Uh, with respect to the telemarketing firms we retain, it's our policy that they not be paid on commission. And in the spirit of the earlier comment, I will specifically check the point and, and get back to you. And my question would be whether that's an item in any kind of contractual arrangement that you have with them. Well, it ought to be. Yeah. And I, I, will, I will confirm the point for you. They may not be on commission, but are, are they on any kind of quota basis? Not a quota basis. Well, um, I want to be careful how I answer the question, because the point is they are not commissioned on the, on, in their compensation. There are promotions, marketing promotions, T-shirts and, uh, you know, other kinds of things for, uh, uh, for good performance. Um, I, there is a business plan every year that governs the way we run our business, as I'm sure AT&T does and other companies as well. And we have, a, we have a forecast, an estimate, if you will, as to the number of sales we will make during the course of a quarter, during the course of a year, uh, through telemarketing as through direct sales and through advertising and, and all the other channels. Um, but that does not get translated into, uh, as you as an individual telemarketer, um, have got to produce X each day, and you then will be compensated better if you produce X plus Y. The, uh, uh, you, mentioned, you said that there is, you attempt 100% uh, verification, telephone verification. Within how long a period of the original call being made does that occur? Usually within an hour. So it's not a case of waiting several days? No. No, it, it obviously, for the reasons in our uh, colloquy a minute ago, it is desirable to make the verification call as quickly as possible so that you minimize the chances of uh, the kinds of problems we discussed occurring. Now, if, that, if the original telemarketing call was made by a contract agency, then who makes the follow-up verification call. Similarly, uh, by a contract agency, but under different management and physically at a different location. And I assume that there's some kind of computer message that goes back and forth. Oh, yes. You know, we, Bob this, Wise is a, said yes, call him back and verify him. Absolutely. There's, okay. a kind of, there's a, a an, automated, an automated system. Okay. Um, and then could you describe for us, is there a routine practice as far as some kind of mail to that customer, and it was my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that 
MCI at least sends a form or some kind of written communication that says, if you do not want to switch, please fill this out and mail it back. Is that correct? Putting an affirmative obligation on the customer to say, I don't want to switch. Let me describe the process. I'm okay. going to better, better way to do it. Anyway. Beg the, uh, your indulgence on the specifics with respect to that last question about the uh, the negative question that's asked because I'm not certain of it. Um, after the telemarketing call and after the verification process, a letter is sent typically within five days of of that telemarketing uh, contact, which in effect is a welcome to MCI letter. Uh, it is a it is a hard copy verification, if you will, but it's a one-way verification. It's us saying to you, Mr. Wise, if you were telemarketed and, and agreed to buy our service, it's an acknowledgment of our, on our part for you to look at that you've bought our process, but it requires that you do nothing. Then, typically within a week or two, you will receive what we refer to as the welcome package. It's got uh, information about the services available to you. It's a, it's a, a more fulsome document, pamphlets and whatnot. Um, in that document, in that package, and with that letter, will come a form asking you to sign and return to us so that we can, under current Federal Communications Commission policies, maintain in our files the written confirmation that you have accepted the service. The document, as Mr. McDonald earlier testified, does go out in the spirit of disclosure, not in the spirit of deception, does point out that if if the form is not returned, the conversion will still, still occur. That is, it is not necessary for that document to be signed before the conversion is going to take place. But it was my understanding that present practice now was to have a written, dis written form affirming Correct. the person's desire to switch. It might it, come into your office after the switch is exactly occurred. Exactly so. Exactly. And that has been our policy from day one. The point I made in my statement is that a very large majority of customers who are telemarketed in a very positive and constructive way choose not to fill out that form and send it back in. That's just a fact of life in the marketplace. And it's for that reason that I suggest this would have an asymmetric competitive effect if it was required. That brings up a point. And I'd like to turn to you, if I could, Mr. Tutton. Uh, first question I have is, does AT&T AT do any telemarketing? Yes, AT&T does a considerable amount of telemarketing. Um, probably not as much as MCI, but AT&T does a lot of telemarketing. We also uh, uh, have a vigorous quality control process that we verify everything from the very beginning of, uh, of the legal review of the script to make sure that every claim and statement that we make in the uh, sales process can be substantiated. Uh, down to uh, training of the individuals who are going to be the telemarketing representatives and the quality and values of the AT&T company and what we stand for, as well as through the verification process of the sale. Uh, so yes, in answer to your question, we do. Mr. I thought I'd read somewhere, Mr. Eidenberg, that MCI was doing something along the line of 7 million calls a year. Is that possible? It's more than that, sir. Um, I believe we're making uh, close to that number on a monthly basis. A monthly basis. Um, and I, I might point out that uh, this is a very dynamic and a very competitive industry. The reason we make as many telemarketing calls as we do is that when the moment of divestiture occurred, AT&T had, roughly speaking, 90% of the marketplace. They owned it from the monopoly days. Um, clearly, we've made a decision that from a cost-effective standpoint, we can reach the customer base most effectively to inform them of their alternative choice with respect to MCI using telemarketing. AT&T has similarly made a business decision that they can spend roughly a million dollars a day on advertising to persuade people that telemarketing is a highly dubious form of achieving uh, market share. The Get It In Writing campaign uh, the $250 million campaign they've been running, their effort to get the FCC to, to put in place this required letter of authorization. It's a well-coordinated, well-financed effort. Um, but the fact of the matter is we make as many telemarketing calls as we make because it is the way to reach into the monopoly carrier's uh, customer base to inform them of the choice they could make. Let me flip back for a second then. Do you have any idea what, how many calls AT&T would be making on a telemarketing basis? Not quite that many. Uh, let me respond to something else, though, that Mr. Eidenberg said, that uh, you know, he's, tr he's trying to move the committee's attention 
away from this fraud issue, and he's doing it relatively skillfully. Well, I would, we haven't finished our I line would, of questions. I would, I would hope you'd not let him off the hook. Um, he, he threw out a bogus statistic that I'd like to try to set straight. He said that one, and a half, one half of one percent of their telemarketing calls end up with this, you know, some sort of a problem. Um, I think the relevant metric here is not the number of calls that are attempted, which I believe he's saying there's seven million a month. The relevant metric is how many people are changing their long distance carrier uh, and then how many are switched against their will. And I can't speak for any other long distance company other than AT&T, but I know that I look at the data that's been going on for the past uh, year and a half, and in the past few months, it's trending over 20% of the number of people leaving AT&T are being slammed. Now, that is a far cry from a half a percent. In fact, I believe the allegation in, in a uh, uh, national newspaper was that 100,000 people a week are leaving AT&T, but that 20% of those I believe AT&T is charging are being slammed. Is that correct? Well, I have not substantiated the fact that 100,000 are leaving AT&T. That's a claim mm -hmm. uh, that our competitor has made. Uh, what I will say is that 20% of those that are, are being stolen. Okay. Mr. Tutton, is there some middle ground? Uh, AT&T has been pressing, and there's been a lot of discussion about the need, should there be a written authorization prior to switching? I, I think it's safe to say your position, AT&T's position, is that there should be. Uh, Mr. Eidenberg says, wait a minute, that gives the benefit to the person who had all of the customers before because it requires much more work to be done. In some ways, I, uh, it reminded me of an, what people call an incumbent protection act, uh, uh, which we're sensitive to around <laughs> here, but um, uh, particularly in the last, these last few weeks, but um, uh, as we go on the endangered species list. But, uh, but my question is, is there some middle ground that gives the verific more safeguard, more verification, uh, yet stop short of the written authorization prior to switching? Well, well let me tell you, the genesis of the written authorization. Uh, as I have personally read through the hundreds of letters and other recorded comments that have come to AT&T uh, from AT&T customers who have been switched without their, uh, without their knowledge, that there is a common theme, and I might add it's the same theme uh, that the woman from West Virginia picked up, in that people expect to have to sign something or feel that it is a natural thing for them to do. So that's basically the genesis of the idea of there ought to be a letter of authorization. Uh, plus, I am uh, totally confident that that will eliminate the problem. So I believe it to be the best solution. Now, is there another solution? I'm sure there must be, uh, but I, I don't know what it is. But let me give you a principle to apply in thinking about that solution. And that principle ought to be, and I believe it's one that you've mentioned earlier in this hearing, is that the consumer, the customer who's involved in this transaction, ought to have to do something. They ought to have to do something. There ought to be a proactive something take place. And I think that's a principle that has to be in there. And that will eliminate this problem. I mean, 90,000 people just in the last six months tell me there is a serious problem out there. And it's an industry problem. It's not just MCI. Yeah, that was, and I'm going to end uh, my line of questions at this point with that. That, that 90,000 figure that AT&T is using, are you saying is that um, all long distance companies combined or is that s simply MCI? No, that, that, that is AT&T customers who have contacted us that are not AT&T customers because something happened that they didn't want to have happen. But do you have and any And some of them out? could have gone to MCI, some of them could have gone to Sprint, some of them could have gone to the other 400-plus uh, uh, long-distance companies that are, exist around the country. Thank you. Mr. McCandless. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Eidenberg, I'd like to go back to our, our witnesses who uh, preceded you. Uh, Mr. McDonald is a s somewhat sophisticated individual who I think uh, very eloquently put out his points and uh, so that we have a beginning uh, reference. Uh, his story to us went something like this. He had never contacted MCI. 
he received the letter that said, even though you don't return this, you're being switched. He went through a number of steps, the 800 number, in which he said, if I remember correctly, the uh, party said that there wasn't anything that they could do about it. Maybe I... Uh, it was worse than that, Mr. McCandless. The 800, he didn't get an answer, as I recall in his testimony. Well, he, he did say that on one occasion he got an answer, but it was a, a short response. They couldn't do anything about it. The staff have... Uh, okay. Okay. Well, anyhow, it was... Uh, a brush off type of, of uh, response in the 800 number. Uh, then, then he said um, that there w he finally got somebody and there would be a charge to switch back some way or another in the contact, which is uh, diametrically opposite to uh, your testimony with respect to the policies of AT&T, or I mean, excuse me, MCI, with respect to no charge, uh, uh, verification letters, et cetera, et cetera. He said he spent four hours trying to straighten this out. Uh, have you got any explanation? Uh, that, you know, one little thing, yes, but uh, you've got a series of events here which are contradict what you have given us as your basic uh, policy as, as an MCI representative. In fact, in Mr. McDonald's case, he did not get charged for the switchback. That is not to gain, say, the fact no, that I, it took him no, 44 but you see, hours But to... you see, he said, there's, he said that he was told there would be a charge for switching back. That's and correct. your statement was that within 90 days there would be no charge. That's correct. And that's the policy of the company. That's so, and, and clearly he was the victim of an error from somebody he talked to at a customer service center for MCI uh, who conveyed the fact. See, there is a charge. The charge is charged to, for the, the local exchange company makes that charge. The consumer should not pay that charge if he has been, and it's our policy, he should not pay that charge if he has been moved. Uh, within 90 days for any reason, and if he's been moved uh, against, against his wishes for, for some reason. So you're, you're correct, Mr. McCandless. Okay. Um, what would be your explanation for his not receiving a verification call? Well, in his case, um, as the chairman and I uh, discussed this matter a few minutes ago, in his case, he apparently never received a telemarketing call in the first place. That is to say, he made no contact with us. All right, we then. made no telemarketing contact let's, let's with him. Stip, let's stipulate that then, that there was no call. Then how did he, was it another error that he got a letter telling him he'd been switched? Oh, absolutely. The, the, what happened, he obviously was switched too. It was not just a letter. He was switched based on his own testimony. He got a bill from us. All I can do is speculate as to what happened, and I, I offered at least one hypothetical explanation for what happened uh, in my comments earlier. Um, it could have been a clerical error at the local exchange company level. Um, but clearly, he was not switched because of telemarketing, because he was not telemarketed. Somewhere else in the system, he was switched. I have a long distance supplier over here. I've never contacted somebody. Nobody has ever contacted me. Nothing has been initiated by my family, yet we have a series of errors. Correct. Okay. Um, let's go to Ms. Simmons. Uh, Ms. Simmons. Ms. Simmons. Ms. Simmons. Ms. I'd be careful about this. Uh, I'm going to be called a male chauvinist. Um, she made a pretty clear story, uh, understandable story, about the history of her contacts. Mm -hmm. And she went into detail, and we talked about it, as to how they would answer the phone and how the message would begin to unfold and over a period of time how she said she was not interested. And we talked about who else was in the house and she volunteered that it was the cat who was in the house and her, which would indicate that she had control over her phones. <laughs> and we have a couple of cats down the hall here if you passed by that come from Texas, but that's another kind of a cat. <laughs> um, how, 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 what kind of errors took place there? Why was she uh, brought into the system as she explained? Well, I obviously can't explain uh, the specifics in her case. I don't know precisely what happened uh, in her instance. Um, but she was switched, and I take her at her word, um, that she was switched without her permission. 
and it was an error somewhere in that system, and I'm not, I'm not simply equipped with the facts with her case to explain to you exactly what happened to her. Now, in discussing this with her colleagues at school, she was uh, surprised to find out that they also had been uh, a subject of this type of marketing. Um, is it a practice to pick on certain areas of the country where there might be a benefit in terms of the number of calls made? Uh, no. Um, we, as I suggested earlier, we use telemarketing quite a lot in our company, uh, but we don't have any, any targets of that sort. Um, it, as much coincidence as anything else, uh, her reports to you. I mean, we telemarket on a nationwide basis, not on a, on a regional basis. I guess it's kind of difficult for me. Uh, I, I also take care of the affairs of an older person and receive all of the advertising uh, that they're going to do grandiose things for you. And uh, on a number of occasions, periodically, there are questions, well, sh why shouldn't I do this? They're telling me to. And it's that particular age group that has a problem in... Uh, in, in, in understanding what this is all about. Somebody writes them a letter, they think in terms of 50 years ago when the letter was something that somebody should act upon. And they lose track of the fact that we're in a heavily advertised uh, society. And so my concern here is that somebody takes the demographics of an area and establishes that the average age in this area is uh, 55 or 57. I have a city in my district where the average age is 65, and it's a matter of public record. And they use, maybe use that as a hypothetical. Well, if we hit that with a telemarketing program, we're going to come out with a certain number because of the demographics of the area. Congressman, I can categorically assure you we are not targeting on that kind of demographic basis and going after people on the basis of age profiles. But that is not to, again, gainsay the problem you identify that in telemarketing, if you can't predict ahead of time the age of the person who's going to answer the phone uh, and their ability to understand the conversation that they're about to have and the consequences of their saying yes, then it is our industry's obligation to put in place a series of standards that govern the telemarketing process to ensure at least a minimum common amount of information is provided to every prospect who is telemarketed, whether by our company or by AT&T's. And if you would indulge me for 15 seconds to make a comment, uh, perhaps it's a point of personal privilege in the sense that uh, my colleague, Mr. Tutton, has chosen several times this morning to refer to our activities as fraud. Um, I just simply want to say that uh, for this record, um, our company is not engaging in fraud. Our company is not, to repeat, perhaps he was not listening when I testified earlier, that our company does not deliberately engage in the practices that you have described this morning as slamming. It's not in our business interest to do so. And I will repeat for Mr. Tutton's benefit that uh, the use of that kind of terminology, in my opinion, is not going to help this subcommittee or the FCC or anybody else uh, to find a solution to a set of problems that consumers have. And I want you to know we're willing to work with this committee to try and find those solutions. Well, this committee is dedicated, and I'm sure I can speak for the chairman, dedicated to find, finding a, an amicable solution to the problem because the problem is obviously there and is not going away. Um, how, many, how many customers would MCI lose in a, in a situation? Do you have a keep, keep track of that? Yeah, well, we keep track of, uh, of uh, some of the statistics. That 20 percent figure that, uh, that you heard a few minutes ago, uh, AT&T's telemarketing, and they do quite a lot of it, as Mr. Tutton testified, um, is in their so-called win-back campaign. They're losing a lot of market share in the residential uh, marketplace, not just from telemarketing, from our advertising, our other competitors' advertising, and direct mail, and all sorts of sales channels. They're losing market share. They started this business with well over 90 percent. They're down to about 70 percent market share. Still dominant, but they've lost a lot. Uh, we go back and check the affidavits I've asked to be submitted in the record, the chairman's agreed to put in the record, are all cases, all cases of MCI customers who were slammed by AT&T. 
AT&T is engaged in an aggressive campaign to go to people and say to them, why are you switching? And to persuade them not to make the switch. Frequently, a customer who may have been telemarketed, Congressman, and agreed to the, to the change, when then confronted with a second telemarketing call saying, why are you doing that? The consumer may be taken aback. The consumer may be, uh, uh, have buyer's remorse and decide not to do it. 20%, 20% of our losses when we go back and check through customers, are being lost because they were switched without their authorization according to their testimony to us. So the, after, the relative after, numbers are about the same. on the After the switching was in place. Correct. Um, Mr. Tutton, do you have any response that any, to any of the questions here? We're dealing with apples and oranges here in a certain respect. Yes, I, I think we are. Um, first, just let me say I, I must have struck a bone. Uh, the title of this hearing is uh, Consumer Fraud, I thought from the press release and the information that I got, which was why I addressed it in that manner. The, um, the issue of the affidavits, this is the first time that I have heard that. We have repeatedly uh, asked, is, do you have any instances? Uh, we have seen that uh, the FCC had gotten a very few number of complaints that AT&T has uh, been involved in a problem. We have uh, investigated those, uh, and they fell in one of two areas. Number one, uh, the issue where husband or wife did not necessarily communicate with one another, or an honest mistake was made. In all cases, the individual was restored to their carrier as promptly as possible, and we've helped in any way to facilitate that. Uh, I am at a bit of a loss as I don't know what uh, Mr. Eidenberg has supplied this group as a form of affidavits. Um, I would go on to say, however, that um, if uh, MCI has been verifying for all of the sales since 1988, and if they have the methodologies in place, which they've talked about and said that they are doing, and the proposal that they're uh, delivering now to solve this problem is essentially the same proposal that they delivered to the uh, FCC in March of this year, that the problem exists and it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. There are, must be some cracks or some mistakes that things fall into. And my belief is, and if we have a problem, we will, as soon as I find out what it is, I guarantee you we will fix it as promptly as possible and we'll commit to get that done ASAP. But I am willing to live by the same rules. I am willing to live by exactly the same rules of a signed authorization card. And I believe that is, as I told you before, the best solution. Uh, consumers tell us that. 90,000 people can't be wrong that a problem exists. And 30 groups, I wouldn't think, uh, are wrong. They're uh, representative of consumer constituencies, uh, regulatory groups at, at all. Uh, it seems to me that that's a logical answer. So that's where I stand. Mr. Eidenberg, you, you've agreed that there is a problem in, well, I think, in, I in think our earlier the, conversation. Uh, if there is one, there was a problem here this morning. There were two customers here who said that they had been switched uh, for whatever reason without their well, permission, and yet, that's a problem. But, uh, you know, Papers are papers, but when we talk in, in terms of thousands of people who are complaining throughout the United States, there is, there is a basis there of some type. They're not all uh, remorseful because they did something that later on they said they didn't want to do. So I'm asking you, do you perceive that there is a problem? I believe that there is a very much exaggerated problem that a very large proportion, based on our own experiences, of going back and checking, and when complaints come to us, we investigate them, uh, that there frequently turn out to be precisely the kind of situation Mr. Tutton described, what from his company's perspective uh, was a, an honest mistake. And I think we do have an agreement here. One person's honest mistake is another person's slam. Uh, and the fact is there are these, there are these, in a highly competitive marketplace, there are these circumstances where one person in the family says yes, another person in the family questions it, or there's a second call from another carrier, there is buyer's remorse. My answer to you, there is a problem. The problem can be addressed by standardizing the telemarketing practices and enforcing those standards. The problem 
implied, however, is that there is this broad base, organized, purposeful effort to move people against their will and without their permission from one carrier to another. That simply doesn't exist as far as MCI is concerned. And to the extent those things occur within my company, they are not occurring as a matter of policy and as a matter of business objective. Let me go into one final area. Uh, we, we heard in testimony and other information that has come to us about uh, various sundry types of what I will call gimmicks. Promotions, uh, that kind of thing. And where somebody signs something with an understanding that they're signing for one reason, but in, in reality they're signing for a long distance service. And MCI has been uh, a part of this program no. as, as it has been brought to us. Nobody testified today to that effect. Well, we do our own research also. I'd like to know about what cases. Um, okay, your position is then we that do. MCI does not participate in the deceptive type of uh, a written document or signed document type of activity, which misleads the individual into uh, believing they're doing one thing when in reality they're, they're signing up for a long distance service. That is correct. We have, a pro we have promotions from time to time, uh, the free phone calling or the $5 yeah. valuation or uh, I you have can specific get reference to a person signing something believing it's one thing and it turns out to be something else. Correct. You do. you do not participate in this? We do not. None of your telemarketers participate in this? Uh, if they do, they're not doing it uh, under any kind of uh, company policy. Uh, we are not engaged in deceptive well, in your practices. Contracts, in your contracts, do you, don't you spell out certain conditions under Absolutely. which uh, you are, are agreeable? Absolutely. Terms? Would this be one of the items in your contract that you would omit or, or not have uh, in terms of spelling it out? How it's addressed in our contracts, if you'd let me submit to the committee after the hearing uh, the details about that, um, I will try and answer you with specificity because I haven't personally read the contract to be able to answer that question in the way you'd like it answered. But I can tell you that this company is not engaging in deceptive telemarketing practices. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tutton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Schiff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do you think Republicans and Democrats sound the same way when people watch us on the House floor? Probably sure. a welcome relief after the last few days. Really? <laughs> Gentlemen, I'll be brief. I know you've testified at great length here. Mr. Tutton, if I may just follow up a little bit, you, you, you stated that AT&T now uses telemarketing itself. Is that correct, sir? That is correct. How long has that been an AT&T uh, practice? Well, we have used telemarketing uh, all along. We use telemarketing uh, to call certain customers during the original uh, carrier selection process. We have been using it to uh, to make offers to customers to buy our Reach Out America plan, to become uh, holders of the AT&T calling card for, for a long time. Uh, we have started to use more telemarketing in uh, during well, late 89 and 1990 um, <coughs> to, uh, to try and uh, win customers and keep customers. And as we just had to. Um, you, st uh, you stated that uh, when uh, Mr. Eidenberg stated that MCI may place as many as 7 million calls a month, you stated that AT&T doesn't place quite that many. Correct. How many is not quite that many? Well, I would prefer not to answer that. It's competitive information. His answer has been in the public record for quite some time, as I gather they're very proud of the fact that they make 7 million calls a month. Um, I would prefer, if you would allow me, uh, n not to answer the volume question. I don't want to push the matter, but okay. if the question isn't answered, then, then I don't know there's a way of measuring AT&T's quality control versus MCI's quality control, is there? Off the top of my head, I can't think of one. Uh, the answer is probably around, uh, oh, five million plus. Um, I would have to verify yeah. that actually, but it's, that's, that's the order of magnitude. It's a okay. high magnitude. Whatever, oh, yeah, I mean, we're not number. talking oh. about us making 100,000 right, and they're making seven million, okay? All right. All right. I mean, okay. Well, but, but actually, I, I, I want to then turn 
to the, oh, by the way, just one other question on that. Does, does AT&T, if someone, AT&T may well speak to someone now using MCI or some other competitor about switching, is that right? That's correct. Um, if I just may uh, take another moment to elaborate on that, on that question. Um, in our lawsuit that we filed against MCI in January, it had two elements. It had one element was the slamming notion, and it had another element which was what we characterized as fraudulent and deceptive marketing practices or hoodwinking customers. And the notion here was uh, statements like AT&T is going out of business, AT&T is not choosing to serve this location anymore, uh, AT&T has re uh, referred your account to me, were being used by telemarketing representatives um, to cause people to say, oh, okay, I, I guess I'll switch to MCI. Uh, we found that we were losing a number of customers. And uh, obviously ones that go over there left here, <laughs> or some other company. Uh, we started a, uh, an outbound calling program to, when we found out that someone was gone to find out why. I mean, maybe they were unhappy with our service. Maybe we had done something to irritate them. And we started calling people to find out why they'd left. And that's when we discovered the slamming and the, uh, these things were being said. Uh, so, and that's how we basically gather the information to determine how many people are being slammed. Then, um, because we don't get name and address during this process, or it would mess it up from a statistical valid, uh, validation standpoint, uh, we then started calling to see if people would like to come back to AT&T. And what we discovered was a significant number of people who had been misled, uh, AT&T is not going to serve this area anymore, said, well, of course we'd like to come back to AT&T. And so a, a number of people have come back. Um, I do not know whether that's what uh, those affidavits are associated with what Mr. Eidenberg has or not, but I just I wanted to shed a little more light on that topic. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tutton. Mr. Eidenberg, sir, if I may turn to you. Please. Uh, Mr. Mr. Tutton has acknowledged a large volume of AT&T calls, which is really all I was, was after, that we weren't comparing uh, many calls with just a few calls. Given the fact that AT&T apparently right now is making a large number of telemarketing calls, perhaps not identical with your own, but certainly an appreciable number, can you explain why the information presented us so far about consumer complaints keeps coming back to MCI for the most part? In other words, uh, you, you've acknowledged the need for quality control, gave several ideas, particularly independent verification, which I think is excellent. And yet the consumers who testified before us today uh, were not complaining about AT&T. Uh, the regulators from the state agencies who spoke uh, were, were constantly referring to MCI or other competitors. They were not com the, the consumers who addressed them did not complain about AT&T. So I wonder if you can explain how when there are two similar telemarketing uh, processes going on, the complaints seem to come towards your company. Right. Uh, first response is to say to you, Mr. Schiff, and to the subcommittee that the affidavits I provided the chairman will be part of the record are, in every case, MCI customers who are alleging that they were moved without their permission to AT&T. Uh, it happened, uh, not for any deliberate reason, but it just happened that there were no customers of that sort on the panel this morning. So to that extent, this panel was not represented. The gentleman would suspend the reason for that, so what the record show is that when we put together the consumer panel, we went to public service commissions, the FCC, and consumer groups, notably the AARP. We did not go to any one company, and also Bell Atlantic. We did not go to any long distance <laughs> company and ask them for a list of the aggrieved persons that they had run across. So I did not think it fair in that situation to put an MCI, somebody brought forward by MCI, on the panel. What I did say was that you could submit all the affidavits you wanted. I thought that those affidavits could then speak for themselves against the figures and statistics that are there, a clear public record from the FCC and in the uh, various public service commissions in relation to the number of complaints coming in regard in, uh, c pertaining to a particular company. So that's, that's the background uh, behind those affidavits. How many I, affidavits I, are there? I have no idea. What, what nine, I think we I used think to mention. 12 or 13 12 affidavits. 12 or 13, fine. Um, 13? 
they, they number in the hundreds, however. We're only giving an illustrative example. But, but, but my point, I agree with the chairman's comments about the circumstances. I just wanted to let you know that but we if have I may, the, the before, I let, before I let you finish, and I, and I want to let you finish, sure. excuse me, but I, I want to just add to that. I was particularly impressed twice, once in a letter that was read by Mr. Tutton, which I have no reason to challenge its veracity, once by a live witness I saw, people who know people have the same complaint. In other words, uh, uh, in the letter that was read, somebody was referred to not only themselves, but their, I believe their daughter, or their mother, mother perhaps, I have that backwards. And uh, one of the witnesses in the first panel said that several people I just happened to talk to around me had the same problem. Now that suggests to me, I mean, that kind of, that's not just a few people around the country, or even a few hundred, that kind of uh, close-knit group uh, that can refer to friends and relations and, 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 and uh, other people they know having the exact same problem suggests an enormous problem to me. And again, I would bring that up along with the idea I've heard no such enormous problem with AT&T. Please, please continue. Two comments. Uh, with respect to the last point you just made, Congressman, and that is the, uh, I think it was, I think it was Ms. Simmons' comments about neighbors and friends who had been telemarketed by MCI. I don't think she testified to the effect that all of those friends and neighbors uh, had alleged that they had been moved by MCI from one carrier to another without their permission. What she reported was that, that a very large number of her friends and acquaintances in her area, in her community, had been telemarketed by MCI. Uh, and that, that doesn't surprise me, given the volume of telemarketing. But to the meat of your question, why would it be that there are apparently more complaints to public service commissions, to the Federal Communications Commission, or wherever they may be about MCI than AT&T, for example, given their high volume of telemarketing? Only Mr. Tutton could answer this question. It is my belief that AT&T's use of telemarketing uh, is growing, is not diminishing, that we have probably been doing more telemarketing for a longer period of time as a sales channel. And related thereto, is AT&T's, it is my belief, and again, Mr. Tutton could confirm or deny this, I, it is my belief that AT&T's, the burden, the, the, the body of its telemarketing calling to date has primarily been in the so-called win-back program and has not been an affirmative program to go out to the customer base at large to get them to come back to AT&T because they've got 70% of the customer base. But the so win they haven't used it for that for that purpose. They haven't had to switch customers. Their strategy, understandably, has been to defend the customer base they have. And I think, therefore, the likelihood of complaints, of problems, of buyer's remorse, of whatever errors are in the system, that the likelihood of that producing consumer dissatisfaction or complaints is going to fall disproportionately on the carrier that's using that sales channel to acquire customers as opposed to defending a customer base, and that is my, my, effort, my best effort to analyze a potential explanation for you. But Winback is, at least, even if it's defending a customer base, Winback calls are going to somebody who presumably has already taken some action to leave that customer base. You're calling a, if you will, a hostile consumer in that regard, the same way that MCI is doing so when it calls at large, given the given the proportion of the market that AT and now controls, is is that not not the case? I mean, they'd be calling someone who's just said we don't want AT and T for some reason, and therefore wouldn't they be just as subject to people being unhappy and the same kind of problem? Well, it depends on the outcome of the event. I'm, my, my, I think my first point is relevant here, and that is the volume and the use of telemarketing by AT and T. I think is growing, not diminishing, and that if you were to take a year or 18 months or two years span of time, there has been AT&T's call volume is increasing more recently and therefore we have been using the sales channel at a higher volume over a longer period of time over the last couple of years and that may contribute partially to the explanation. All right. well, um, I understand. Uh, gentlemen, I have no further questions with the Chair's indulgence would like to make one observation on, on this situation and all other uh, telemarketing situations. Uh, it is obvious to me, as a, as a legislator, that uh, if, comp now this is beyond the specific matter of AT&T's calls versus MCI's calls, but if complaints continue in this area, in the telemarketing area, in the volume we're hearing about them, 
whether it's on this subject or any other subject, and really regardless of who is the telemarketer, then I have no doubt that uh, more severe laws limiting or even uh, totally eliminating telemarketing entirely are coming. So I would uh, respectfully urge everyone involved in telemarketing to have the firmest possible internal and quality controls, or I think it will not exist in the near future as a marketing mechanism. I want to thank the panel and thank the chair. Thank the gentleman. And just following up on that, I would note the genesis for this hearing, at least in my mind, was not a national article or national complaints. It was a fact of the complaints building up in West Virginia. And uh, that, of course, is obviously what gets a member of Congress uh, first is the constituency. But if that's occurring in a rural area like West Virginia, and, and I would assume that a Florida and a California and a Texas would be the, the real hot markets uh, for this, then it shows that there's very aggressive telemarketing occurring and that a lot of people are feeling that it's uh, imposing on them in some way. I want to come back to verification and to um, Mr. Eidenberg. You'd spoken about verification. We'd spoken about the general, uh, about the contract arrangements. My question is uh, whether your company would have objections to supplying the general contract that it uses uh, with a telemarketer uh, to the subcommittee. Um. I believe we probably would on two grounds. Number one, the proprietary nature of the business relationship involved. And number two, as Mr. Tutton indicated, there is a uh, litigation. And uh, with the chairman's indulgence, I certainly would like the opportunity after this hearing to consult with counsel on that, on that important point. Since I had not, uh, the subcommittee had not alerted you that that might be a request, uh, uh, then I don't think it's fair to, to direct you to do that. I w however, we would be looking at the least for a, uh, a uh, statement of what your practices are. Uh, as you'd already indicated, I believe that you were prepared v to give. Very happy to provide that. The, uh, um, but continuing on with this in terms of verification, what sort of, in, there have been some complaints also about abusive pr uh, language uh, as well as aggressive or overly aggressive sales tactics. What sort of internal check system do you use with your contractors specifically? Do you do any kind of on-the-line monitoring? We do, and uh, my, it is my opinion that we need to do more uh, based on what I heard here this morning. I that guess is absolutely intolerable. I mean, I don't, I don't want to leave anything to the imagination on this point. Nobody, regardless of their choice in the marketplace of what they will or won't do, uh, should be subjected to pressure, let alone verbal abuse, uh, for their decision. One concern I have is that in trying to do the mathematics of if you're making seven million calls, you're making several million calls, I assume the other companies are involved in this as well. Skip all the uh, uh, folks that want to sell me a cruise someplace and, and whatnot. Um, so there, per month there are millions of calls in the neighborhood of say 15 to 20 million calls going out. I see this chain of I see an MCI or an AT&T or a Sprint or so on, but then I see at least one step removed from the process, a contracting agency, I've got a feeling that there's, that some of their uh, hiring practices may be a little loose. It seems to me this can be pretty distant from the home office. And the question then becomes with the large volume of calls and the large volume of people that have to make those calls, how you are able to police that? Well, speaking for our company, um, we have a relationship with a, uh, a telemarketing firm out in the Middle West um, that does a large proportion of the contracted out telemarketing. And uh, we have a very close relationship with that firm. In fact, we have an equity position in that firm. And we, it is our responsibility to manage that relationship and to manage the, super, the managerials, managerial group of that firm and their operation as if they were employees. Um, this whole experience, this hearing, the level of complaints, the fact that the issue is on the public agenda to the extent it is, is A, a reflection of problems that have not been managed to the level they should be. It is also a reflection of why they must be managed to a better level. Not just my company, AT&T, Sprint, others not represented here, because it's not in any of our business interests to have the problems Mr. Schiff alluded to uh, perpetuate, to have, it, I mean, we spent too much time and too much effort generating uh, our, our goodwill and our presence in this marketplace to squander it for any short-term purpose. So the implication behind your question is, 
we treat those contractors as if they were employees from a standpoint of management control, and we've simply got to do better at it. Mr. Tutton, uh, what you know of the telemarketing that uh, your company does, do you use the same verification process that MCI has outlined as, as is their procedure? We, we do not. Well, let me tell you what we do. Yes, sir. That'd be a better way. <laughs> okay, fine. Uh, essentially, it takes one of two forms. Uh, either a, uh, uh, the call, after the, the sale is made, the person is asked, would, would you confirm the fact that you want to buy, and that is recorded. And then those recordings are all played back to make sure that every single sale matches with the documentation that, yes, somebody did it. That's one method, the recording method. The other method is uh, when a representative uh, speaks with a uh, customer, the individual says, yes, I, I want AT&T service. They raise their hand, and a supervisor or a verifier comes over and uh, asks them to repeat back the fact that, yes, they want the AT&T service. And then there is a code known only by the verifier that's entered in that matches uh, the record. And th that's basically the two ways that we do it. We do not have a separate organization, a separate physical location. Are like, these, uh, then are these direct AT&T employees doing this telemarketing? They're either AT&T employees or uh, employees of contractors that we have a contract with. But you're with. saying you don't then have a separate contractor going back and doing the verification? Well, correct. We, we do not have a separate organization or a separate group going back. Do either of you gentlemen have any knowledge of whether this is strictly limited to residence, residences or is it also occurring with pay phones or businesses? Mr. I can Tom. comment on, uh, uh, as I said, my responsibility is the consumer services, but I also have the responsibility for our, uh, what we call our public or people on the move business. And public telephones uh, slamming has been a, uh, a major problem. It's uh, calmed down a bit now. Uh, but as, as you know, the 1.4 million public telephones in America essentially went through that choose a long distance uh, process during the first quarter of 1989. And uh, those were implemented by around June, July. Uh, subsequent to that, and AT&T was reasonably successful in that effort, uh, subsequent to that, though, we began to see large volumes of business just disappear. And whole rows of telephones in airports, hotels, etc., would all of a sudden be switched. And when we'd go back and find out, we found that slamming was going on. And there were just a variety of, of different schemes going on in the industry. And uh, I believe it's the state of Virginia, I can't, I'm trying to recall. A number of states have have investigated it and found out, and in fact, not, disallowed certain companies from doing business in those states. So the short answer to your question is yes. The long answer is it gets very complicated, but it's going on. Mr. Eidenberg? I, I want to make sure I understand Mr. Tutton's comment and that there is a separate industry of which we are not a part. That is, we are not in the payphone business, but we do offer long distance services from payphones. But our arrangement with vendors, private, retail establishments that may have a pay phone uh, located on their premise is we have a business relationship with, uh, uh, with such an individual who will be paid a commission uh, in order to uh, give us the long distance service from that phone, dial one service. So I don't think that Mr. Tutton's remarks should be confused with the issue we've been focusing on primarily here today and that is the companies going out and selling end user customers through telemarketing. We're not, we're not in the process of of going to the Bell Operating Companies, for example, and telling them to switch their pay phones from one long distance carrier to another. It doesn't work that way. Uh, with respect to what is happening in that industry, I just have not okay, got information. That's pay phones, but what about businesses? Um, I do, given the complexities that we've explored here this morning, not just with our panel, but with uh, preceding panels, uh, there are no doubt uh, instances out there of individuals who will say that they found their business establishment phone switched for some inexplicable reason. But we are not telemarketing. We are not telemarketing uh, the business community. Uh, we sell the business community primarily through advertising and through direct sales calls and direct mail. The, um, uh, 
NARUC has proposed that customer be sent a written verification of a switch within three days. Uh, I'd like to ask each of your reactions to that proposal, and I'll start with Mr. Eidenberg. I think that is well worth considering. Uh, we, I don't see the, the same problem we've got with the proposal that's before the FCC today. I think the neighborhood proposal is, uh, is one we could live with and would add a level of uh, protection for consumers. Um, my fundamental problem with that, that uh, solution is that the, the customer has to do something to prevent them being changed against their will, which just doesn't strike me as right. I mean, I should not have to prevent being ripped off. I should have to initiate a change. And so that's the fundamental flaw I see in that. Mr. McDonald, the consumer, one of the consumer witnesses who seemed to have spent a lot of time on this, uh, suggested an idea of uh, dialing, when you get notice that you're being switched, of dialing a certain access number to confirm. First, is that technologically possible, and is that something that, that could be workable, Mr. Eidenberg? It's technologically possible. Um, my concern with it is that it would not solve the problem Mr. McDonald and the committee and all of us have been discussing because you then open up the possibility of somebody else in the family, perhaps even a minor, <laughs> using the phone to confirm or to make um, uh, a call and uh, to, to put in some codes that were not intended by the, uh, the responsible person in the family. Mr. Tutton. I haven't thought that particular proposal through. Let me just fall back on the principle, though, and that, that deals with the principle. And the principle is the consumer ought to do something to cause the change to take place. And that clearly is present in that solution. I would have to spend some more time thinking through the implications, as uh, Mr. Eidenberg has pointed out, and how it would work. Technologically, I think it's possible. I, I, don't know, I have no idea how much it cost. I would appreciate <laughs> if uh, you would. Uh, we're going to leave the record open a little while on this. And if you would think about it, and just write us and let us know. I will do that. The only problem I can see is if you set your phone on redial, and uh, you've got a three-year-old like I do who loves that button. Um, have 15 uh, lines in there by the time you stop. Um, let me check and see whether any of the panel have further questions. Mr. McCandless. I would like to pose this question to the panel. Uh, give, given what appears to be the continued severity of this problem for whatever reason, and the fact that the FCC may or may not act favorable to it, or may not act at all, that leaves then the states and the public utilities commissions or whatever the organization's name is within the state, the responsibility of reacting to what would be the demands of their state. Um, which would you prefer, that the FCC solve this problem on a total nationwide basis, or that if they don't, uh, the states begin to pick up the wand and, and do a uh, something with it. Mr. Raven? My response would be if at the end of the day the government has to act, if it, if it feels it must take a step uh, in this arena, I would prefer the FCC to be the body to act so that there would be a nationally consistent set of standards and, and procedures in place because telemarketing takes place on an interstate basis. Um, we don't have telemarketing centers in every state in the Union. We have regional centers and and that's one, ex one ex response. The other point I'd add, Mr. McCandless, there is another option. Uh, and it's an option that uh, I think all of us, and despite litigation, despite competition in the marketplace, despite uh, unhappiness with comments we each make from time to time in public or in private, I think this industry has an obligation to address this issue. And I would like to think because it is in our common business interest for this problem to be solved, that perhaps what the compromise position could be is that with the FCC's oversight, without it having to get into the rulemaking business and regulatory business, but under its oversight so that there was public accountability and through the FCC back to the Congress, this industry could sit down and I believe work out a set of standards and protections and work out some of the differences you've heard articulated here on this panel and put in place a set of procedures, perhaps some of the ideas I've had, perhaps some other ideas that other people have proposed, but the combination would be an industry approach done in public 
fully accountable, but not necessarily with a regulatory rulemaking oversight um, that would address the meat of the issue here and provide this bill of consumers' rights in telecommunication, in, in telemarketing. Mr. Tutton. In response to the question re regarding the uh, uh, state regulation versus federal, um, I'm not an attorney, but my understanding is that the, uh, the FCC clearly has the right uh, to regulate how people select their long-distance carrier. That's, that's, that, that's not the issue. The issue is inaction by the FCC would true. demand then that states who are so inclined the you problem with fill the, a vacuum. Right. The problem with the states going ahead is, and there have been a couple of states that have moved forward, um, is that you get a patchwork quilt or a hodgepodge of different rules from state to state that any corporation uh, that operates in a national basis, like MCI does, like AT&T does, like the other uh, long-distance companies do, that it's going to increase costs and it's going to be di very difficult to comply with what could turn out to be a lot of different regulations. And since it is a national issue, it's a national consumer issue, since the FCC has uh, the ability to regulate the way long distance carriers are, are chosen, it's clearly, I believe, something that the FCC can act upon and act upon very quickly. The record is clear. Uh, the problem does exist. You have established that again today. Uh, they have listened to comments. So I, I, I say that the FCC is the right person and they can act very quickly. Thank you both. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to congratulate you, Mr. McCandless. Once again, you've proven to be a consensus maker. You've brought uh, two very diverse companies uh, and gotten them to agree on something at the very end of the, uh, at the proceeding. I, I want to say I want to thank you very much. And I also want to say, though, this problem is not going away that uh, uh, I look at the statistics in my own state in which the record n complaints are growing at a record number. I look at the fact that at the FCC level, I think they almost doubled last year. I look at the fact that within your own companies, you're talking about a rapid escalation. And then I also look at the fact that millions of calls are being made every month in telemarketing, in seeking new customers, and that it's not a problem that is going to be with us. And that I, I'm concerned that you're going to see thousands of complaints escalate to hundreds of thousands of complaints in a short period of time. Also, add to that the fact that we're going to have a new wave of competition coming shortly, as has been described when some of the uh, local uh, telephone companies get into expanded, uh, expanded long-distance service. And so I see this problem only, only growing. Uh, I think that the FCC has to act on it, and I was, in, I was interested to hear that both, the, both companies agree that that's where it ought to occur. It seems to me that it's a national problem that's growing, and it's an interstate one, but I have a feeling we're going to be back again. I do thank you very much for being here, for taking the time, I think, for being as forthcoming as you have been, and we look forward to uh, receiving some of the submissions that each of you had indicated you'd be willing to make. Thank you very much. The next panel uh, will be the point of view of a local carrier, uh, Mr. James R. Young, Vice President, Regulatory and Industry Relations, the Associate General Counsel for Bell Atlantic. Mr. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Young, would you raise your right hand, please? Certainly. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, or help you God? I do. Mr. Young, your entire testimony, will, written testimony, will be made a part of the record, and so please feel free to summarize. Uh, it's, you've heard the testimony, and if you care to react to that, of course, what we're interested in, I think, is basically the point of view of, of a company such as yours or the subsidiaries of Bell Atlantic. What uh, does this put upon them? and where you, because uh, you're the one who makes the switch, and where you think some of the burdens ought to lie. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I will be brief in summarizing. Uh, yes, we have heard about the magnitude of the problem. Uh, our perspective as the local exchange carrier, or actually as the, the company that owns local exchange carriers in seven states in this region, is that uh, the, the practice of unauthorized switching of customers from one long distance carrier to another has a significant impact on us as well. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it has the quality of impact that it has on some of the consumers you've heard from this morning, but it does have a significant impact. Those numbers in my testimony, uh, 18,000 unauthorized switches in 1988 up to 37, well, a little more than 37,000 in 1989 to more than 80,000 that we project for 1990, we have to investigate each and every one of those. Each and every one of those comes in as an individual call to our business office. And then we have to uh, find out where the truth is here. Now, uh, 
I, I should add, too, those numbers, uh, those are not mistakes that we have made. There was some suggestion this morning that maybe part of the problem is, uh, well, the, the, the local exchange company makes some key punch errors here. I'm not going to tell you that we never make a mistake. We do make mistakes. But those numbers I gave you are ones that we've checked to see whether or not we made the mistake or not, and we did not. Those are ones where, let me tell you how the procedure works. Customer calls up and says, my long distance carrier has been changed without my consent. We go back and check our records, check our records to see whether we've made a mistake. And then we go to the uh, inter exchange carrier and we ask the inter exchange carrier uh, for some proof. Show me that th this, this customer is now your customer. Where's your written letter of authorization? Where's your proof? And, and those are instances where the inter exchange carrier could not come up with any proof. So what we do in that instance is, you've heard that there's this $5 charge for changing inter exchange carriers. We take that off the customer's bill. We, uh, we, there's another charge I'd like to get to in just a second. And then we, we, that $5 charge is, is uh, put over on the inter exchange carrier. That inter exchange carrier also has to pay for the cost of, of shifting back. And then there's an additional charge. Um, let me get at this in this way. Uh, when we saw this problem growing, we asked ourselves, what could we do? Because it has an impact on us. What can we do? And, and as I said, the immediate impact on us is the fact that we have to investigate each and every one of those complaints as they come in. Now that's a significant amount of time by skilled people in our business offices. So we said to ourselves, well, one solution to this is to, to, to look back there, to figure out what those costs are, and to, to develop a charge that would be imposed on the inter-exchange carrier who switches without the customer's permission. So at the beginning of this year, we filed with the FCC a tariff to impose that charge. And in May, we were successful in getting that approved. Now that charge is, uh, I think it's about $23 for business and residence, about $40 for coin. Uh, so would you, 23 for business and residence, how much? And about $40 for coin. You asked, is, is there slamming at coin stations? Yeah. And our experience is we've had it there too. Uh, so that was one step that we could take. Other local exchange carriers are taking the same kinds of steps. Bell South uh, has had a similar tariff approved, and Ameritech has recently filed. Mr. Chairman, you asked, well, was there some middle ground that could be taken here, some middle ground to help deal with this problem that wouldn't push us as far as the written letter of authorization? Uh, that some people have argued has a, a, a stultifying effect on competition, but would still provide some consumer protection. Our notion was, well, one way of providing that consumer protection was to try to take some of the profit away from the, pra from the practice of slamming, to impose a, a, a charge on people who do engage in the practice. Now, I can't sit here and tell you that this charge, which is a cost-based charge for us, is high enough to, do, to, uh, to, to accomplish that result we don't know yet. It's only been in place a couple months. Uh, I think a couple other things have to happen. We'd like to see the other local exchange carriers implement charges like that, and we'd like to see what effect that has on the problem. If the level of these charges isn't great enough to sufficiently deal with the problem, then perhaps we need a higher charge. For example, some sort of penalty that would be imposed by the FCC. But we think the, the reason we focused on this is, is a solution is that, as you've heard today, uh, there are millions, literally millions, of changes in pre-subscription pre status, changes in inter-exchange carriers that go on every day. Uh, in our millions every day, I guess I shouldn't have said it quite that way, every year, in our region alone, about 2.6 million a year. And to us, it appears that the vast majority of those are handled in an efficient, automated way where the inter-exchange carrier comes to us they provide us the information on an automated basis, we receive it on an automated basis, and everything works fine. The, the value of that kind of arrangement is that it holds down the charge that we charge when you, have to, when you change inter exchange carriers. And we think that's a pretty good result. We don't want to have to hire a bunch of extra people to deal with this, and we're not sure it's in anybody's interest to, to get that charge up too high. If you go to a procedure, that requires us to deal with these instead of on a mass automated basis, requires us to deal with them on one phone call at a time or one letter at a time, what you'll do is you'll push those costs up and you'll push that charge up 
for changing inter-exchange carriers. So that's why we tried to come up, following your suggestion, Mr. Chairman, we tried to come up with a little different approach. Now, uh, one of the things I, I, I was grateful for being here this morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, was to hear some of the additional ideas. Uh, Mr. McDonald's suggestion, for example, I hadn't thought about that, and I can't sit here and tell you that I think it would work or wouldn't work. Uh, one thing I know, though, uh, all wisdom wasn't invented with us or with me, and when I hear an idea like that, I'd like to check it out and see whether it's going to work. But our, 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 our theme here is let's find an approach like the charge we've developed, which should help to take the profit out of the practice of slamming, but will not uh, impose unnecessary costs and burdens on transactions where there is no problem. Thank you. Mr. Young, you mentioned numbers of people have complained of being slammed, and you mentioned some figures in the aggregate that it seems like you're looking for a doubling this year, almost to 80,000 people. The kind uh, of growth we don't like to see. Yeah, you know, of slamming. Uh, do you have a breakout uh, of these numbers by carrier? Yes, I do, Could Mr. You Chairman. Could you supply that? Uh, yes, I can. In the, the numbers for 1990, uh, those are roughly 63% uh, per of those complaints are customers who claim that they were switched to MCI without their consent. Uh, AT&T is about 8.45% and the others are varying percentages. That MCI percentage is a little higher than it was in 1989. In 1989, the figure was roughly 53%. Has Bell Atlantic approached MCI and said, you know, we seem to have a problem here? We have had correspondence with them, Mr. Chairman. We've asked about their uh, procedures. In 1989, when we saw this problem developing, we had some communication. Uh, I must admit to you, sir, that I, I can't quote you chapter and verse about that, but uh, after discussing the matter with the carriers, we came to the conclusion that filing this tariff to impose additional costs on inter-exchange carriers who do change customers without the customer's consent, that that was the, the way that we could accomplish something most readily. What does this, if the present practice of slamming continues or at least stays the same level it presently is, what cost is there to the rate payer? Put aside, for instance, the individual consumer who goes through the, the hassle and headache of getting switched back and whatever charges may be brought about there. What is the cost to the rate payer overall? Is there anything that you have to roll into the rate base? Well, Mr. Chairman, that's the reason we came up with this additional charge. This, by coming up with this additional charge, we've tried to see that, that the ordinary rate payer is not burdened by uh, practices of a few carriers. We want to see the people who cause those costs be the one to bear them. So I think the answer to your question is because of the, the steps that we've taken in this year, uh, in Bell Atlantic, ratepayers don't pay anything for this. But in, the, but in past years, this has been part of the rate base. Uh, but that's why we thought we had a, a, an obligation and a duty to act as quickly as possible. In your opinion, is uh, slamming a genuine problem or uh, competitive red herring, as some have charged? Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, when I see numbers increasing at the rate that I've seen, and when I listen to the people that I've heard this morning, including the uh, commissioner from the Florida Commission, uh, it, it's hard for me to dismiss it all as a red herring. Some mistakes are going to happen, but it, it seems to us it's a real problem. The volume of numbers that we're seeing s tell me that it's a real problem. Given the volume and the way it's increasing, do you or your company have any uh, opinions about the or thoughts about the adequacy of the telemarketing operation and particularly the supervision by the, the carriers? Well, I think a telemarketing operation can be adequately supervised. We do telemarketing, for example, and we have strict oversight and verification procedures. I think it can be adequately supervised. Uh, I, I guess I'm not in a position to, to sit here today and tell you that I think any of the inter-exchange carriers do or don't have that level of supervision. I, I hope that answers your question. You've heard the proposal suggested by AT&T, MCI, and NARUC. Uh, do you have opinions on any of these, and particularly well, the three-day authorization, uh, the well, I think authorization, authorization uh, uh, verification that, that NARUC is talking about? Well, uh, when I first read the NARUC proposal, I thought it had uh, some considerable merit to it. But as Commissioner Beard described it a bit more, it became apparent that 
part of the proposal is that there has to be individual, an individual call to or from our business office for each pre-subscription change. At least that's, I think, how he described it. Uh, I'd have concern about that because of the additional cost that that's going to impose. That is going to increase the cost of changing inter-exchange carriers for those millions of people who do it without difficulty. So I think we'd want to think that one through very carefully. I think he's made an important step. He's tried to craft a proposal that's going to allow customers to move from inter-exchange carriers without the, some of the burdens associated with the AT&T proposal. It's a creative step, and I think he deserves a lot of credit for it. I still have some questions about it. Isn't there, uh, at some point, a crunch? And I understand Bell Atlantic's position, and I assume the position of other um, operating companies, that you don't think you ought to get socked with the cost of doing these verifications, because it sounds like it's going to be quite a... Uh, costly and time-consuming operation. I understand that. But I also understand that somewhere there's got to be a written or verified authorization that, that yeah. improves upon the process we've got. I don't have any difficulty with a rule that says that at some point there should be a written authorization. Uh, I just want to be sure that when we come up with, if we come up with a rule like that, we craft it in such a way that we, we're, we're thinking about the millions of people uh, the millions of changes that are made in our region uh, every year, and not just the, th the, t the tens of thousands, important though they are, where today there's a problem. I, I think we ought to be smart enough to come up with a way to do that. I think, uh, you know, perhaps, uh, well, again, I, I, you know, I come back to our proposal. I, I don't want to uh, betray a, a not invented here syndrome when I, when I talk about it, but uh, that implicitly requires the inter-exchange carrier to have some proof. Maybe he doesn't have to have it right away, right when the change is, right when the change is ordered from us, but eventually he's got to get it. And if he doesn't get it and the customer complains, then the carrier is going to have to pay. You have put into place, as I understand it, a, a, uh, an attempt to cover the cost of slamming. Yes. Yes, sir. But I've got a feeling you're not going to recover everything uh, through that. Is that correct, or do you think that you can recover? Well, our aim is to recover all of it. If we find that our, our costs of dealing with these problems are greater than our tariff rate, we will be back to increase the tariff rate. I appreciate that. Um, Mr. Young, we appreciate the, the time you spent and the uh, assistance you've given the subcommittee. As I mentioned to the previous panel, I think that this is a problem that uh, unfortunately is only going to grow, and I think the telemarketing part of it. Well, let me follow up on one last thing yes, on sir. telemarketing. Uh, you, of course, a lot of calls go through uh, uh, your companies from various telemarketing concerns. Is this, uh, this verification problem, do you see it come up in other areas besides long distance companies soliciting business? Well, let me give you a, for instance, as I said, we do telemarketing, and we have our own verification procedures. Now, I couldn't sit here and quote you chapter and verse about those, but we're very serious about those because we know that the image of our company is going to be hurt if we're slipshod. So uh, we have independent verification procedures. When I say verif independent, it's not the, the, the person who makes the sale who has to verify the sale. We have those internal procedures, too. It affects our services as well, and we think it's important. I'm just curious, uh, with Bell Atlantic, is your telemarketing done by, through a contract agency, or do you do it with your own employees? Uh, I believe we do it with our own employees, but I'd have to check that to if, be if, absolutely sure. If it sure. turns out that it is other than that, if you would let the subcommittee know. Be happy to, Mr. Kind Chairman. of like uh, switching. If you find out you don't want to switch, write us. Uh, otherwise, we'll assume it, uh, that you want to go ahead with it. Yes, sir. So, um, Mr. Young, we appreciate very much your, your appearing here and the assistance you've provided. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The final panel, uh, having patiently uh, gone through all of this, uh, will be representative of the Federal Communications Commission, Mr. Richard M. Firestone, Chief of the Common Carrier Bureau. Mr. Firestone. Following the practice with other panels, uh, you have no objections to being sworn in. You raise your right hand. You swear that you'll tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Thank you. Mr. Firestone, your written statement uh, has been made a part of the record, and we invite you to proceed in any way you wish, but I'll tell you what, if that's a vote, uh, why don't I go vote very quickly and come back? 
I would some votes I would miss. However, this is a civil rights uh, bill, and I better not be found wanting. I'll be glad to wait. Thank you. Committee hearing will resume. Uh, we have testifying before us is the last panel, the representative of the Federal Communications Commission, Mr. Richard M. Firestone, Chief of the Common Carrier Bureau. Mr. Firestone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I have submitted a fuller statement for the record. Yes, In the sir, interest of time, I will abbreviate my oral statement this morning. And I would also appreciate if you have any reaction to some of the things you may have heard, uh, testimony you've heard previous uh, while you've been waiting. I'd appreciate that. I'll be glad. Uh, I'm pleased to appear before you to present the views of the Common Carrier Bureau about the unauthorized switching of a customer's long distance carrier. You've asked us to discuss what actions the Commission has previously taken to protect consumers against unauthorized changes and what remedies are available should a problem occur. I will then address what further action we might take to attack the problem. Currently, the Commission requires that a long distance carrier certify that it has a signed authorization from a customer or has instituted reasonable steps to obtain one. If a customer complains about a switch and a letter authorizing that change cannot be produced, the Commission requires that service be switched back at no expense to the customer. This includes the fee for the unauthorized conversion, as well as the fee for switching the customer back to the original carrier. Frequently, the carrier will not even attempt to produce a letter of agency, but instead will pay all of the fees. Over the last year, the Commission has seen an increase in the number of complaints for unauthorized conversions. We are concerned when anyone's long distance service is changed without authorization. When the Commission receives a consumer complaint, the complaint is served on both the long distance carrier and the local telephone company. The Commission requires that the long distance carrier who caused the unauthorized conversion pay all the fees for switching the consumer. If the switch was a result of an error on the part of the local telephone company, the local company absorbs the fees. In addition to the rules in place to protect consumers and the complaint process to ensure that carriers restore original service without charge to the consumer, the Commission also acts when it sees an increase in complaints against a particular carrier. This has included review of the carrier's telemarketing practices. Despite these safeguards, it appears that further action may be necessary. You have heard from other witnesses today, as we have in recent months, that many consumers have complained about being changed without their understanding or consent. While the Bureau is very concerned about such practices, we are also concerned that any remedy used to eliminate abuses be tailored to achieve that goal. AT&T's petition would require a long distance carrier to have a signed letter on file before submitting a customer order to the local telephone company. The Commission had imposed such a requirement in 1985. The Commission later amended that requirement, however, in response to overwhelming opposition from the industry, including AT&T. The long distance carriers claimed that imposing the letter of agency requirement would bring telemarketing to a virtual halt. The Commission wanted to ensure that consumers could most easily take advantage of the choices and price discounts being offered in the increasingly competitive telecommunications marketplace. The Commission amended its requirements to allow long distance carriers to certify that they had the letter of agency or had instituted reasonable steps to acquire it. At that time, the Commission found this struck the appropriate balance amongst providing consumers the greatest choice in the marketplace, facilitating the carrier's marketing efforts, and at the same time providing consumers needed protection. The Common Carrier Bureau is dedicated to finding the best solution to the problem of slamming without discouraging or hampering the competition that will serve cons customers better. In addition to the option now supported by AT&T, several other options have been recommended and are being considered by the Bureau, including, first, Establishing a cooling off period after a customer is contacted by a long distance carrier. A customer would be allowed a specific amount of time in which to return a letter of agency or refusal card to the long distance carrier or the local carrier. The long distance carrier could submit the change order only after the cooling off period had expired. Second, we could prescribe the form and content of long distance carrier order and notification forms. This would include labeling the form so that it is clear that a customer is choosing a long distance carrier and clearly describing the transaction involved. And as you heard from the representative of the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners this morning, uh, the possibility of specifying the time period in which that notification form would have to be provided to the customer is also a possibility we're considering. 
Third, we could restrict the ability of long distance carriers to collect charges billed to customers switched without authorization. Though we do have a concern about the potential for fraud if that were to become a widespread practice. Fourth, we could require the branding of long distance calls. This would require that the long distance carrier providing service be identified for a fixed number of calls or time period after a switch in company. Customers would then immediately be aware of a switch rather than discovering the change only after receiving a bill in the mail later. Fifth, establishing minimum telemarketing procedures, another subject that you've heard some about this morning. And this could include independent verification of the order procedures to determine that a customer did in fact authorize a long distance carrier change. The Common Carrier Bureau is in the process of reviewing all of these options and more uh, in order to make recommendations to the Commission regarding the best approach to the problem of solving unauthorized conversions. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you and I'll be happy to answer uh, questions that you have. Thank you very much, Mr. Firestone. The, um, I was interested in on page three of your statement in which you summarized states that the Commission requires a long distance carrier to certify to the local telephone company that it has a signed authorization from a customer or has instituted reasonable steps to obtain such authorization. As I understand it, that is currently the FCC requirement. That's correct. That correct. And how long has it been the requirement? Uh, since 1985. So theoretically then, none of this should be occurring uh, that we've been hearing about for the last uh, five hours. Well, in part, you've heard two things. One, that uh, the carriers send out the uh, uh, welcome kit or whatever name the individual carrier chooses for it. And this is, by the way, uh, among all of the carriers, AT&T, MCI, and the others. Uh, send written materials to the customer that include a form to be sent back. The reality of the telemarketing marketplace, as all of them describe it, is that only a certain number of forms do come back anytime something is sent to, to customers. Perhaps even more significant with respect to the specific proposal that was raised, namely requiring that the carrier have that form in hand before any switch take place is the practice that has been described to us, again, by all of the participants in the marketplace, MCI, AT&T, and others. When they get those forms today, they tend to put them in boxes and ship them to a warehouse. The notion that with the, uh, again, disputed numbers that you've heard today, but hundreds of thousands of switches taking place, authorized, uh, well-informed switches taking place, the notion that uh, these hundreds of thousands of pieces of paper coming in each month could then be located on an individual basis, locate the one piece of paper with this one named individual out of this warehouse of paper, and then provide that when a complaint came in. The reality is that even today, with far less paper involved at this point, uh, the carrier's practice is just to pay the charge to convert the customer back, and then as they have represented it, they don't have any interest in having a customer who is complaining about them on their roles that's not going to do them any good from a business perspective. And so the notion that the, the, uh, having the piece of paper in hand uh, is necessarily a solution to the problem uh, or is one that could be verified and, and monitored even uh, is one that uh, just loses track of the volume of paperwork involved and the difficulties involved in that. So it is one of the options we're considering, but it is not the only option we're considering as a way to address this problem because we see some of the trade-offs and some of the downsides uh, to that. And I can go into a couple more uh, examples if you, if you would. Well, I'm staying on this for a second. What is a, quote, reasonable step to obtain such this authorization that you refer to in your statement? Well, the general industry practice, as I said, is to send out a notification to the customer uh, indicating typically in a positive uh, form, welcome to, here's the, new, and the, the name of the company, indicating what services are available uh, and providing at that point a form to be sent back in uh, and requesting that that form be sent in. But as uh, the representative of the local telephone company who is here today testified as well, uh, the volume involved, I think the number he used was 2.8 million changes in his territory alone uh, going on each year. The notion that that would be a manual process rather than an automated computerized process is a very difficult and very costly one for them to contemplate. But what do we do about the person, there were two of the three consumer witnesses claim never to have been contacted 
um, and definitely never have been sent any kind of verification or, or never have received a verification either over the phone or as I understood it in the mail. So there, nowhere is there any kind of authorization on file with that, with the slamming company. Mm -hmm. What do we do for them? I mean, it seems to me that there's a big group out there that uh, are being slammed and there's simply, there's no paper trail, nothing, uh, what, what, do you, what, what kind of sanction are you imposing upon this company? Well, a couple of things take place. First, uh, when a complaint is filed uh, and we serve it on the long distance carrier and the local carrier, unless the long distance carrier can uh, produce that letter of agency, the long distance carrier has to pay all the costs, not only for the original conversion, uh, but for the conversion back to the carrier of choice. Uh, as uh, the Bell Atlantic representative uh, indicated, uh, Bell Atlantic and uh, now I believe uh, one other uh, of the Bell operating companies has in place, another one has already applied for, uh, a very dramatic increase in the cost that would be imposed on the long distance carrier to take care of the cost of that unauthorized conversion and switching back. Uh, and the commission has approved those uh, tariffs and allowed them into effect. The uh, other part of the uh, complaint process is in a number of instances uh, I make telephone calls, uh, then I find out that that's not the company that I wanted to be with. Perhaps their charges are higher, perhaps not, but what do you do about that? Well, a couple of things. As I indicated, almost inevitably, when uh, the charges are higher, those are, are credited back to the customer. In fact, the local exchange carriers, sometimes when they have billing arrangements with uh, the long distance carrier, themselves have the authority to, to uh, 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 give a credit for a limited amount under those kinds of circumstances. Uh, but the reality is that those long distance calls were made from that telephone and there is a reasonable charge for those calls. So we'd be especially concerned, as I said, if the customer was paying more than they otherwise would. Uh, but the notion that the customer should get back to the carrier of choice as quickly as possible and with no cost to the customer has been the point of emphasis as opposed to saying that the customer uh, would be liable for no charges whatsoever for those long distance calls. As I indicated, that is one of the options that's been talked about in the record, uh, but the, the risk, if you will, in announcing uh, that someone uh, would be liable for no costs uh, uh, under uh, one of these conversion situations is it's a license, in a sense, to some uh, to uh, perhaps make even thousands of dollars worth of calls uh, and be freed from that. So an alternative proposal it would be to consider perhaps just a, a small credit uh, under those circumstances. But those are the kinds of options that are being weighed. Mr. Firestone, uh, how many complaints has the FCC received regarding slamming? And it, are they increasing or decreasing? Well, they're clearly increasing. If I can give you some kind of sure. progression uh, idea. Uh, at the start of 1989, uh, the first few months, it was about 10 or 20 per month. Uh, in, in the time since then, up until about the last three months, uh, the average has been on the 50 to 75 complaints per month. Uh, in uh, about three months ago, the uh, American Association of Retired Persons put an article in its uh, magazine uh, describing this problem and asking people to write AARP. They provided about 400 additional letters, which we have tr treated as uh, informal complaints also and are processing as the other complaints. Uh, and so uh, for the last three months, we've obviously seen a, a much larger number. Uh, but as I indicated, uh, we are concerned when uh, a problem exists that that uh, any care, excuse me, any customer uh, may not have the carrier of its choice, uh, and we think that does present a problem. Uh, the context uh, that uh, some of the witnesses earlier talked about, I believe the Bell Atlantic witnesses, I said, used the 2.8 million uh, conversions in his territory each year, and I, I, the term I think he used was the vast majority of which are perfectly justified and, and at the request of, uh, of the customer. Uh, and so uh, we don't want to hamper uh, the competition in the marketplace, the offering of new services, the offering of discounts, and making those readily available and easily available to customers.
but we do want to address the problem of uh, the customers who uh, have been slammed, who have been converted without either any notification or who have been misled in that process. Do you ha can you give the subcommittee a breakout on uh, uh, the percentage of complaints made about each company? I couldn't do that off the top of my head. I will be glad to try and uh, produce that uh, for the record. We do keep a, uh, on our computerized files uh, an indication of the companies involved uh, in each of the complaints we get in, in any area, uh, and uh, we will try and provide a more detailed breakdown for you. Uh, Are you that. aware whether one company break, stands out above the others in terms of well, this, complaints? this has varied somewhat over time. Uh, in part, as we understand it, different companies engage in uh, new telemarketing campaigns uh, for a time period, or just as they do in new advertising campaigns, uh, then those trail off and, other, and others pick up. Uh, there was a period where uh, there were a large number of complaints uh, involving U.S. Sprint. Those have diminished uh, more recently. And uh, uh, by far the majority of the uh, complaints now involve MCI. Uh, we do have complaints, I should note, uh, that involve uh, this among uh, almost all carriers, including AT&T. Uh, and trying again to put it in some kind of context, uh, I believe you heard a give and take among the witnesses earlier uh, as to whether they ha engage in different kinds of telemarketing campaigns. Uh, with different goals, different numbers of customers at issue, uh, and it makes uh, the process of evaluating the context of uh, how many complaints against a given carrier a little more difficult. Uh, as I indicated in my testimony, when we have seen these spikes, if you will, increases, particularly with respect to individual carriers, we have met with them, we have called them in and reviewed the kinds of practices uh, that they've engaged in and talked about possible solutions uh, including such things as independent verification, uh, as uh, 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 getting out from under the um, incentives or, or perverse incentives, perhaps, of commissions uh, being the driving force behind not only the telemarketer, but the verifier. Uh, and there have been changes in the telemarketing marketplace uh, in that time. Clearly, they have not eliminated the problem. I don't want to suggest anything to the contrary. And so uh, that's why I indicated we are considering a number of other options now how best to address the problem. Well, that brings up an, an important point. Uh, as you see a spike up in complaints about a particular company, are you calling them in? And my question specifically would be, it, without asking you to divulge if you've been talk what companies you've been talking to, have you been having conversations uh, concerning these complaints over the past, uh, say, three months with any of the companies? Yes, and, and uh, with a number of carriers, and uh, we've also had submissions by some of the carriers, and I believe MCI this morning testified to you about a new submission it's, it gave to us uh, last week uh, where it talked about uh, its uh, upgrading of its telemarketing procedures, uh, its call for uh, uh, such things as verification of those procedures and independent outside auditing of them, and uh, their suggestion now that these new steps that MCI has taken uh, should be translated into uh, industry-wide uh, steps being taken by all of the carriers. So there have been those ongoing discussions. There have been, as I, there has been, as I indicated earlier, movement in the marketplace. Uh, we are not convinced at this point that the movement in the marketplace has been adequate to eliminate the problem. And as you heard from consumers this morning, uh, it clearly has not totally eliminated the problem by any means. A lot of what's come out at this hearing, I feel, are, is concern over the telemarketing practices, obviously, and I think that's something that's probably going to be, have to be the subject of further investigation by the subcommittee. But does the FCC itself do any monitoring of the telemarketing practices of the inter-exchange carriers? No, and, and one interesting point, I think, uh, that, that you, you referenced and that had come up in the, t in the testimony is uh, the difference between uh, a problem with telemarketing and a problem with unauthorized conversions. There are unauthorized conversions that have nothing to do with telemarketing, nothing to do with the use of the telephone for that. Uh, and we have complaints involving uh, cards filled out at shopping centers uh, and uh, uh, m direct mail solicitations with written submissions back from the customer. Again, one of our concerns is whether the notion of requiring a written document the letter of agency that AT&T has proposed is necessarily either the best solution or would even solve the problem because there are a number of complaints dealing with what might be the uh, deceptive advertising kinds of questions in the marketplace 
which might be more a, a Federal Trade Commission or State Attorney General consumer protection type issue because they don't necessarily involve the telephone and would be, in a sense, no different than uh, the uh, deceptive advertising that might uh, go along with the marketing of any other product. And in the telemarketing field, of course, uh, people are bothered or, or served, depending on your perspective and perhaps whether they interrupted your dinner or not at the point of the call, uh, with telemarketing offers to buy insurance, uh, to buy a lawnmower, uh, and on down the list. Uh, it uh, would be an interesting situation if the only place uh, you couldn't use the phone to order service uh, was to order phone service. Yes, sir, but don't, do you believe there's a distinction in the examples you just gave where somebody calls me about a lawnmower or any of the other products, I'm going to have to do something that is clearly affirmative uh, to, to get that product. I'm going to have to give them my social, uh, well, my, my credit card number. We're going to have to work out some form of payment. It's just not going to be their word that I signed on. They'd be, they're not going to send me the lawnmower unless they've got something that helps them get the, get the payment for it, which is different than the situation we're describing with these long distance companies. Well, I think one of the witnesses earlier uh, made reference to the fact that uh, they get telemarketing calls from entities with which they have established relationships. Whether it's a bank you already deal with, or whether it's a department store that already has your credit card uh, and or catalog operation and such. So I don't want to suggest that they are identical by any means, but in all of those instances it is not necessarily the case uh, that you have to give them new information in order for them to have the ability to bill you for a product or a service and to begin that process. So I think there is a broader problem uh, that, that deals with marketing and telemarketing in a sense. And then there is a problem in particular that deals with, with telemarketing abuses that trigger unauthorized conversions. And that is what, as I indicated, we are focusing on. What is the best solution to that unauthorized conversion or slamming problem? I agree with you on that narrow point, but I'm just concerned because it makes me concerned that the FCC may be seeing it this way, that, that you can lump telemarketing uh, practices together. Even in the situation where you just described, the bank that I deal with calling me and offering me something else, that's not, that's not the same situation because that, uh, to have the equivalent would be to have my long distance company that I'm already a subscriber to calling to offer me something else as opposed to a totally new person that I don't have a relationship calling to offer me something else. Seems to me that there is a distinction here and that it's important uh, uh, to, to recognize that because I think you're going to have to deal, that is the FCC, are going to have to deal with this telemarketing practice dealing with long distance companies and slamming differently than you would with any of the other myriad of telemarketing practices. I, I agree. I, I was not suggesting that they are all lumped together or identical by any means. I was just uh, indicating that, as I had heard earlier in the testimony of other witnesses as well, there are a number of problems in the marketplace, not all of which are focused on unauthorized conversions. The telemarketing issues are, in a sense, broader in, a, in, in one sense. And then also the unauthorized conversion question is not limited to one of un unauthorized conversions based on telemarketing yeah. because there are also unauthorized conversions with written documentation. Uh, the shopping center solicitations, for example, where you fill out a form uh, uh, at a shopping center uh, and customers claim they are misled sometimes in, in that practice. So I wasn't lumping them together or suggesting that our analysis would lump them together, just indicating that there are a number of problems that have to be considered. And as we view what might be the best possible remedies, we have to take into account the different mechanisms and methods uh, uh, being used in the marketplace and how best to address them. Can you testify that you do not have the exact numbers of complaints and that you would supply those for the records, but can you give uh, a ballpark figure? Are we talking in the order of several hundred complaints in a year? Oh, I'm sorry. I gave you a, the monthly flow. I can give you, since January of 89, it's been about 1,800 total. Mm -hmm. But uh, and that included the 400 that came in as a result uh, in, in the, uh, the last couple of months as a result of uh, that uh, article in the AARP magazine where AARP gave us 400 of the letters uh, from uh, their readers. So that, the 1800 is since January of, of 1989. When I said I didn't have the exact numbers with me, I meant I don't have a breakdown carrier by carrier yes, uh, off the top of my head. I couldn't give that to you. But would you agree that that suggests the tip of the iceberg and that the uh, one operating company, uh, only one, is projecting 80,000 slamming cases this year in their uh, multi-state region? Uh, if that's extended across the country, 
then I think you're, you're looking at perhaps uh, a million uh, slamming cases. Some, so it sounds to me like few people are getting to the FCC or indeed even to the public service commissions, but, are, but the bulk of the complaints are going to the, op, to the operating company or perhaps to the long distance carrier. Uh, I just wondered how the FCC, if you're putting any kind of uh, evaluation on how, how extensive the problem is. When we look at all of our complaints in this and in other areas, we don't uh, uh, by any means uh, suggest or believe that the number of people who, who uh, contact the FCC is uh, an, a measure of the number of people who might be unhappy or disaffected in the marketplace with some practice that has taken place. Uh, what we do look for in particular are things like trends, uh, numbers increasing, new practices, and, and those kinds of things. Uh, when I do look at the number of complaints, I do compare them to other areas as we decide how best to apply our resources, of course, and I also do try and put it in the context of uh, the uh, area or the kind of conduct where those complaints are coming in. And that, if I can make reference again to the testimony earlier uh, where we, we see millions of complaints, excuse me, millions of conversions taking place in the Bell Atlantic Territory, for example, because that was the witness today, but the same is true nationwide. Uh, millions of, of conversions taking place uh, and a large, but proportionally we have to, to wonder how large number of problems in that. We want to address the problem. We want to solve the problem, but we don't want to burden in terms of cost, in terms of inconvenience, uh, in terms of effects on competition in the marketplace and the benefits that consumers will get from continued growth of competition in the marketplace, in trying to solve the problem, we don't want to harm or damage the, the uh, uh, benefits of choice uh, that uh, consumers are exercising in the marketplace. A $64 uh, dollar question, Mr. Firestone. Uh, AT&T filed its petition for rulemaking uh, in January, approximately 10 months ago. And the question I have, you, you've listed some recommendations and some things that the FCC is considering. Uh, when do you anticipate the FCC acting on this petition? I don't argue, I'm not presenting that as a brief for AT&T. I am asking that, though, in light of when could we expect some further FCC action, given the fact that this problem seems to be increasing in the testimony I heard today, suggests strongly that it's only going to increase. Well, let me uh, uh, answer, if I can, with, with two parts of that. One is uh, where we are right now in the process, uh, and then second, when you might look forward to, to, to further action. Uh, the comments uh, were submitted in this proceeding in March, uh, but have been supplemented by, with a number of meetings with industry and a number of submissions by AT&T, by MCI, and by others uh, just in the last few weeks. In fact, one coming in from AT&T yesterday. Uh, and so the, the record, our investigation, has been going forward. We have been learning uh, much more. Uh, in fact, some numbers were provided to uh, the committee uh, this morning uh, that the carriers have been uh, loath to provide uh, previously because of their emphasis on the lawsuits going back and forth in the industry and the, and the uh, competitive pressures back and forth in the industry uh, as well. I noticed that, and incidentally, if you've got other areas that you need to get information in more quickly, just let us know and we'll, we'll <laughs> schedule hearings accordingly. But uh, in, in, I, I should in emphasize with respect to that that uh, we have been concerned not with respect uh, as much to the impact on the companies of how many customers they gain or lose uh, as a result, but the, the impact on the customers. And so some of that information wasn't necessary for us uh, to decide that there was a problem that required us to go forward and consider alternatives. Now, what happened was AT&T came in with when it filed this proposal in January with a specific proposed remedy or what they maintained was a remedy. Um, we have analyzed that and, and uh, uh, talked to uh, other people in the industry, talked to AT&T about it. Uh, as you heard, uh, state commissions, the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners has uh, a, a proposed uh, solution. Others have come in with, with proposed solutions. And so we are focused now more on what are the best options to put in front of the commissioners for solutions to the problem as opposed to where we might have been earlier in the process, which is, uh, is this something that, is, uh, that warrants even be putting before the commission? Well, may so, I read from your remarks and you think it is a problem that warrants bringing it before the yes, commission. You're now at yes. the stage of what do we do about it. Exactly. Uh, and the, the, uh, what 
proposed remedies, what mechanism to do that is, is uh, where we are right now. Uh, we are preparing uh, a series of options and we'll be discussing that with the commissioners very soon. Depending on the kind of mechanisms selected uh, requires, for example, if, if I'll take the, the perhaps easiest example, if AT&T were to get its wish and we were to go forward with a notice of proposed rulemaking calling for a, a letter of agency uh, being in hand, uh, that requires a formal rulemaking proceeding. We will then, of course, have uh, uh, to go out with uh, a notice of proposed rulemaking and under the Administrative Procedures Act have comments and reply comments submitted in that proceeding with respect to the specific proposal, the specific proposed uh, solution being put forward in that notice uh, and then would act based on the record in that proceeding. So uh, the, the uh, uh, possible solutions trigger certain procedural uh, requirements as well. It seems to me from the testimony we heard from two public service commissions and, of course, the representative of Nehru, that there is a consensus that there is a problem out there and that something needs to be done about it. Some suggestion was made that this is something the state public utility commissions ought to be handling themselves. Uh, I wonder if you could address that and whether the FCC feels that way or indeed whether there are some measures that the PUCs could be taking or whether this is something that should be handled strictly at a national level. Well, I, I, absent the word strictly, I uh, was going to concur with the, the, uh, where I thought you were heading with this. I don't think this is something that should be limited to federal action where states would have no role by any means. However, as I indicated in 1985, uh, the FCC first established the requirement that there be a written letter of agency provided for conversion, uh, then amended to, to allow for uh, uh, best efforts to, to uh, obtain such a letter. Uh, in 1987, uh, the FCC ruled that uh, a customer could not be charged for a disputed conversion and that the cost of converting that customer back had to be imposed on the carrier. And so the FCC has established rules in this area already, has been enforcing those rules in this area already. So the notion that additional steps might be necessary in, because uh, uh, the problem continues despite those actions uh, still suggests to us that it is appropriately uh, one for the FCC to consider and take action on. One, one more uh, question uh, you'd said in the near future. Do you have any ballpark prediction on when the commission might be acting on the recommendations that you submit to it? Well, that's a slightly harder question because then you're asking what the commissioners will choose to do as opposed to when will I be able to make recommendations to the commissioners. Uh, and, of course, uh, they may uh, want more data, more information. Uh, we will uh, be starting to meet with some of their legal assistants later this week uh, to discuss what we've learned thus far and, and uh, uh, what the options we see before us. Uh, but uh, I can't tell you at this point when you, the commission itself might act. That is obviously something uh, is there that the five commissioners control. Is there even a chance that we might have some uh, uh, new proposals uh, from the commission uh, in order to head off Christmas slamming. <laughs> I can see the new telemarketing gimmick. Uh, get your, you, know, you get a uh, $10 gift certificate if you uh, sign up now with Company X. And I, and, and I say that lightly, but then also there's the representative from the Public Service Commission in Florida said he sees a new wave of telemarketing coming uh, in months in months and the year ahead and sees uh, this problem only multiplying. Yeah. Well, I should indicate that if uh uh, someone signs up because they've gotten something that says uh, we'll give you ten dollars to switch. I'm not sure that that's a no, slam exactly. in any case. Uh, and in fact, uh, there have been a number of promotions no, and discounts see, provided. But but let me no, turn I see to a the wave question. Of telemarketing coming though that's, uh, that uh, will result in increased unauthorized switching. Uh, well, that that issue aside of the inducement. Well, as you heard this morning, when one company says it is making seven million telemarketing calls a month and the other says five plus million telemarketing calls per month. Uh, there are already significant waves of telemarketing. Uh, but the, the question of whether we will see increased numbers of unauthorized conversions or whether that might in fact decline, uh, I don't think necessarily follows from that because that level of calling has already been in place. 
some of the carriers are indicating some of the steps they're taking internally. Plus, you heard from uh, Bell Atlantic, for example, about the new higher costs being imposed uh, on the long distance carriers if, in fact, unauthorized slamming does take place. Uh, but uh, I, you know, we will be working with the commissioners to get them information as rapidly as possible. I just cannot tell you when the commission might uh, uh, act based on those recommendations. Well, we will leave the record open. Uh, we may have some additional questions that we'll submit to you. I would just urge that, that uh, since you've made the determination, which I'm delighted to hear, that there is a problem, and incidentally, on terms of getting number of complaints versus how big a problem, why is this rule? Uh, as relates to a congressional district is that every letter is worth at least a hundred angry people. Uh, the 99 others chose not to write, but they're out there. And so uh, that you've made the determination, I think, is a positive sign that there is a problem out there. I see, we see it growing. That was the purpose of this hearing and would only encourage the Commission to act as expediently as possible uh, to, to um, uh, move on this. As I say, from the local arena, which is basically where I'm from, uh, there's an awareness of this problem of slamming uh, that, is, that surprises me, quite frankly. Uh, it has surprised me the level of intensity and the number of complaints that are coming into our office. And if, I, if our office is any indication and it's a rural area once again, then I assume it's happening in this volume across the country and it's something that I think the Commission needs to, to act on as soon as possible. I appreciate very much your time. I know you spent a lot of time up here listening and appreciate, as always, your, your uh, concise testimony. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. At this point, uh, the record of this hearing will be left open for additional questions that may be referred to the witnesses. Uh, the record will be kept open for some period of time. Uh, whether or not there will be additional hearings will be decided later. I declare this hearing adjourned. C-SPAN 2 programming information is available to our viewers 24 hours a day. For the latest schedule rundown, you may call 202-628-2205. That's current information about C-SPAN 2's live gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of the United States Senate and other public affairs events that provide an inside look at government in action. Yesterday at the Department of Transportation in Washington, the secretary of that agency, Samuel Skinner, along with the administrator of the Federal Aviation Administration, James Buck. Thus, those agencies' steps in conjunction with the federal law enforcement agencies and intelligence groups to beef up security at our nation's airports and train stations, among other locations. Coming up next, we bring you their comments and responses to reporters' questions. The two also discuss the price of airplane fuel since hostilities broke out in the Persian Gulf region.